Okay, good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this uh, uh, new iPromo, iPromo day. Today we will have uh, uh, two lecture session, and uh, the, the session will, uh, will, will be focused on climate change, and uh, particularly the title is Post-COVID-19, Climate Change in Mountains, Its Drivers and Effect, an Overview. And we we'll be held, first of all, by Professor Claudio Cassardo. Professor Cassardo is a professor on, of Turin University in the physics department. And we will we'll hold the first uh, two, uh, two hours of, the, of today. Then we will have uh, um, Professor Elisa Palazzi, but I will introduce uh, uh, her uh, when uh, she will appear and start uh, her, her part of the, of the lecture. So now I'm giving floor to Professor Cassardo. Claudio, please. Okay, thank you. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. So now I want to try to share my screen. Just a minute. Okay. Okay, it's appearing. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to wait for the time of WebEx, <laughs> yeah. which is never so fast, but uh, I wanted to introduce... Uh... Oh, it's it disappeared. That... Yeah, I say that there is a problem. Let me try again. Anyway, uh, I am... Uh... Because of the title climate change in the mountain, today I decided to move in the mountain. So I am speaking actually from the Alps in the Western Alps of Italy. Okay, it's appeared. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, so the photo is not mine because today the, the sky is completely covered by clouds. So there is no any possibility to make photo of today, but uh, anyway, this is a place in the Alps, and uh, I will, would like to talk about the climate change or climate in general, and then introducing the problems that we have in the mountain. So, uh, this is what uh, I will talk today, a short introduction about the climate system the difference between climate and meteorology, this is very important because there is a big confusion between climate and the meteorology. And uh, I will talk about greenhouse effect and the climate factors. Then I will introduce the climate change by presenting the data, observation of particularly of temperature and precipitation. Then we will discuss about the reason of climate change, uh, particularly uh, the greenhouse gas. And uh, I would like to give a, a short uh, explanation about the behavior of greenhouse gas during the COVID period. Then uh, uh, I will just introduce the modeling of climate change, just introduce because Elisa which will follow me, will uh, speak more about this factor. And then if I have time, uh, just two slides about what to do to contrast the climate change. So to introduce the climate system, I usually prefer to display this uh, figure because uh, here it is uh, uh, paint uh, every component of the climatic system starting from the sky in which we have the sun and the solar radiation is uh, the, the biggest driver of the climate system. Then you can see in the bottom the earth, the land part with uh, vegetation, volcano and the atmosphere with the cloud and the phenomena and the ocean. All of these components are a subsystem of the climate system, they react to the meteorological phenomena with a different time scale. So, as I told you, let's start with the difference between 
meteorology and climatology or between weather and climate. It should be very clear the difference, but because there is a large confusion, I wanted to repeat again. Weather is defined by instantaneous conditions. So if today I go out and I measure the temperature, the wind, the humidity, and other meteorological factor, this number represents the weather. But not only instantaneous, even if I average in one day, one month, one year, or even 10 years, this is part of meteorology. Climate is different because you need to take the statistics, for instance, the average, the average is the simplest statistics, but you need to do over a very long period, at least 30 years. This is the minimum period on which you can talk about climate. So the average temperature of a location or of a, re a region, this defines the climate. The average on a shorter time, like one or two years, this is still part of meteorological variation. Of course, meteorological data are subject to large fluctuation. For instance, you can consider the difference of temperature between day and night or between summer and winter, but also between two different conditions of El Nino. So El Nino is a phenomenon in which the time lag is about two to five years long. So this variation are part of the meteorological variation. So for, to do the climate, you need to perform statistics on, for instance, temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind, and so on, on at least 30 years, 50 years, even better, 100 years, even better. This is an example of weather. This map represents the temperature anomaly, which means the difference with respect to the average of yesterday. The biggest map in the left, you can see in which place yesterday was warmer than the normal. That is, uh, you can see the red color. Red means warmer, blue means cooler. So you can see that, for instance, most of Europe excluding Spain, is red, so yesterday temperatures were larger than normal. In the smallest figure in the right, there is the absolute temperature. In the left, there is the anomaly, so different difference with respect to the average. In the right, there is the absolute temperature. You can see that the information in the left is much better because you can see the deviation from the mean directly. In the right figure, you, you have a very large span of temperature from the polar area to the equatorial zone. So it's very complicated to appreciate directly where it is warmer and where it is cooler. This is uh, instead an example of climate. As you can see, here there is uh, the precipitation during winter one line means one year. We have a very large series of precipitation in Torino city. And uh, the ensemble of all these observations represent the climate of precipitation in Torino. As you can see, you can see very large interannual variability. Some winters, the total of precipitation exceeded 400 millimeter. In other winter, you, we, we recorded a, a bit more than zero millimeter. So this is variability year by year is very large, but on the average, the signal is almost constant. So more or less in the last two centuries of data, uh, precipitation during winter in Torino has not to change it. Also, this is a, an example of climate information.
still precipitation, but in this case, uh, precipitation fallen as a snow. So this is a part of the previous graph. The previous graph uh, showed the, the total precipitation, which included the rain and snow, but here just the snow. And here you can see, again, very big variability year by year, but you can see also clear signal, especially in the last century. The total of snowfall, the annual total of snowfall has decreased in Torino city. This is an evidence of climate change because this is the double effect of the constants of precipitation, but the increase of temperature. Increase of temperature produce a decrease of snowfall. So, climate factors, which are the most important climate factor that we must consider to define the climate? Uh, I mentioned the, the most important five factors. One is the elevation, and you can see in the figure in the left high, you can see the profile of the mountains, and uh, if you go up, uh, you can see that the type of climate is changing and uh, as a result, also the vegetation will change. Consider that the distance between the, the bottom of the mountain, which is, uh, for instance, the Po Valley, anyway, the plain below the mountain, and the top of the mountain in the Alps is about four kilometers only four kilometers, but in this four kilometers, you have almost the complete number of ecosystems in the world, just is missing the tropical uh, ecosystem, but all the other you can find in just one individual mountain. So elevation is a very important factor, and also the the side of the mountain is important because you see in the central mountain in this figure that the ecosystem line they are tilted not horizontal because the side which receive more solar radiation is warmer so the temperature is also warmer and so the vegetation can survive at a higher altitude second still mountain, but in this case, the importance of the mountain has to be considered as a mountain range, because a mountain range can oppose to the wind. So the wind must uh, go up to the mountain. And in this case, there is some meteorological phenomena which are persisting in that place. So in this uh, very small figure, you can see the topography of the world and you can see the biggest mountain range, for instance, in the American continent, the Rocky Mountain, the And, and in Europe, there is a line of mountain from the Pyrenees to the Alps, to the Carpathians, to the Balkans, up to the Asia, in which you have the Himalaya mountain range. And this is a barrier to the flow which produce some typical meteorological phenomena. For instance, upwind, you have a stronger precipitation. Downwind, you have a very few precipitation. So in case the flow is persisting in direction, you can have a different climate, upwind and downwind. This is what happens, for instance, in America. North America, for instance, near California, and South America, for instance, near Peru, and uh, in part uh, also uh, Chile. Third climatic factor, latitude and seasons. And this is due to the tilting of uh, rotation axis of the Earth, because uh, the Earth has a rotation axis which is tilted with respect to the orbital plan. So we have the seasons and the seasons uh, produce a temperature difference during the year, and this is a, an important climatic factor. Also, latitude produces different tilting of solar radiation, and then it means that the temperature is different according to the latitude. 
uh, also winds depending on general circulation today of course i have no time to discuss the general atmospheric circulation but uh, according to the general atmospheric circulation there there are some winds uh, which are persisting for all the year for instance the trade winds or the westerlies or the polar easterlies and uh, these uh, wind systems produce uh, weather which is persistent in some area and this uh, define the climate finally the ocean currents are very important because they influence the temperature of the surface of the sea and then this means that they interact with the atmospheric circulation cooling some place and the warming some other place according to the temperature of the current the, this uh, slide shows you a result uh, of the climatic factors. This is a graphics in which you have two axes. In horizontal, you have a precipitation in a centimeter per year. And in vertical, you have air temperature in a Celsius degree. For instance, we are in, a, in a Torino, Torino province. Torino has uh, an average precipitation of 800 millimeters, so 80 centimeters, and uh, a temperature, mean temperature of about 15 degrees. So you can uh, locate uh, the typical vegetation in Torino area, the natural vegetation, by tracking the line 80 in the horizontal axis and 15 in the vertical axis you go in the middle of the woodland or glassland. This is the typical vegetation of Torino area. But if you change the amount of precipitation, you also, or you change the temperature, you change the typical vegetation, natural vegetation. For instance, I pointed with red the two border of temperate forest to show you that they are tilted at this border because if temperature increase, also evaporation increase, then you need to have more precipitation to compensate the evaporation. So the border of uh, temperate forest at five degrees is uh, with less than 100 centimeter in one year, but uh, at uh, 15 degree, you need to have about 150 centimeter per year to sustain temperate forest. So warmer place need more precipitation to compensate the evaporation. Oh, <clears throat> the, uh, as I told you, climate is the result of a statistical study applied to meteorological data for more than 30 years. Here, I show you an example of uh, statistics application. For instance, uh, this is uh, one episode, the heat wave of summer 2003 in Europe, in particular in Swiss, in these graphics. And you can see in the left part below three sectors in which you have the distribution of the summer temperature, summer mean temperature during the different years in Swiss. So this is an example of statistics applied to, to the temperature, for instance. You can see the concentration of vertical line around the Gaussian curve, which is the curve depicted in the figure. And you can see, for instance, a hole the 2003 year is far away from the other years, and it's also far away from the Gaussian curve. And uh, this is uh, just an example showing you that uh, it's, a, it's a way to represent the statistics according to the distribution. In the bottom panel, you have uh, the distribution of the predicted uh, temperature for the climate of the end of this century and you can see 
the Gaussian curve is much more flat, and uh, the 2003 is uh, very close to the maximum of the Gaussian curve, which means that the, perhaps the temperature recorded in the summer of 2003 in Swiss will be an example of the average temperature during the summer of the end of this century. This you can directly see even without knowing so much the statistic method, just looking this uh, this image. Uh, as a other example of climatology, I wanted to show you three figures taken from different sources. This one represents the temperature variation in the last 60 million of years. 60 million of years ago is in the right part of the graphics and the zero, which means today, is in the left part of the graphics. And you can see how the temperature has changed in the last 65 million of years. This is a clear example of climatology, of course. Sorry. Uh, this one is another figure still representing climatology. Here, the period is more short. It's just one million of years, actually 800,000 years. And uh, 800,000 years ago is in the left, zero, which means now is in the right. And you have two variables. One is the temperature measured in Antarctica. And one is the carbon dioxide concentration still measured in Antarctica. Why is important this kind of figure? Because they give you an, an idea about the typical variation of the climatic variable, including greenhouse gas. So, for instance, looking at this figure, we can see, we can imagine that in Antarctica, the typical range of variation of temperature during the last five glaciation was of about 10 to 12 Celsius degree, between difference between the minima, so the glacial period, and the maxima, the interglacial periods. Also, we can have an idea about the carbon dioxide variation. Typically, carbon dioxide varied from 180 part per million during the minima and about 280 part per million during the maxima, so interglacial period. You can also see the clear correspondence between the maxima of CO2 and temperature and the minima of CO2 and temperature. And finally, this is the graphic showing the temperature in the last uh, one and one hundred and a half years, starting from uh, 19, uh, 1860 up to now. And uh, these uh, uh, data are expressed not as absolute temperature, but as uh, uh, anomalies. So difference between the average. The average has been calculated over the bull period. So 1880 to 2018. So zero means the average of this period. This graph has been uh, uh, produced by using direct observation made with the thermometer in the world. The previous graphs have been constructed by using other techniques because, of course, the thermometer were not present 800,000 years ago, nor 65 million years ago. So we use the other techniques. As you can see here in the vertical axis, you see the expression delta oxygen 18, delta 18 O. This is a, a proxy data, so a measurement which can give uh, an expression proportional to the temperature. So from these graphs, we can infer the temperature. Okay. Now I want to concentrate about this, uh, this figure. 
this figure show you the global temperature in the last uh, 160 years and uh, as you can see uh, also here it is expressed as a temperature anomaly and uh, here the period in which the anomaly is calculated is the third year period written in the bottom right 1981 to 2010 third year period this is the reference period you can see many of these graphs but maybe the reference period is changed so please pay attention about the graphs oh here uh, you can see uh, many information actually i could uh, spend uh, half an hour in just describing this figure. Of course, I will be shorter because I have not so much time today. But substantially, you can divide the, this long period in uh, actually about four parts. The first part up to 1900, in which temperature is about constant and very low. Second part in which temperature rise from 19 uh, zero zero to 1940 approximately and uh, you can see that the, the temperature is uh, slowly increasing then from 1940 to 1975 you have uh, a slow temperature decrease and the last period is from 1975 to today in which you have a temperature increase dependence the the, the derivative of this increment is larger than the derivative in the first part of the century if you compare between each other so the warming rate since 1975 is much larger than the warming rate at the beginning of the century okay this is the general thing the second information i'm sorry that uh, uh, I cannot separate the figure, so it's partially masked by, by the, the table. But you can see that here you have not just an individual line, but actually you have a six line overimposed. Actually, it is very hard to distinguish one line by the other. This means that the lines are very similar to each other. Each line represents the average of temperature reconstructed by a different climatic center. You can see the name HUD crew, GSTEMP, NOAA, CNW, ECMWF, and Berkeley. There are the name of climatic centers. And each climatic center calculates this average by collecting data from a, a, a group of stations. They are not equal, the station because each center make the appropriate choice. So the station can be different, but the result is very similar, especially in the last part of the figure, in which you can hardly distinguish the individual line. Third information I want you to point out is that if you look at the curve, you can see that the temperature change year by year normally you have a year very warm then two or three years later it is a year very cold and then warm again cold so it's continuously up and down the period of, of this up and down is about two to five years but sometimes you have a peak very big i locate with an arrow the largest peaks the, the first one is in 2016. This is actually the warmest year of the record. And the anomaly was larger than 0.6 Celsius degree. So that means that in 2016, the temperature was 0.6 Celsius degree larger than the average 1981-2010. If you go back, you can see another big peak in 1998. 
1998 temperature anomaly was uh, larger than 0.2 Celsius degree. If you go still in the back, you can see another large positive anomaly in 1983. In this case, anomaly is uh, minus 0.1. Actually, each of this uh, year produce uh, the, the hottest year of the record. So in 1983, it happened that 1983 was the warmest year of the record. Then in 1998, again, 1998 was the warmest year of the record. And 2016 is still now the warmest year. So as you can see, by looking the peak respecting to the, the line I tracked, uh, you can see that the difference is like this. Can you see my slide? Because uh, it, seems, yes. it seems that somebody is not. Actually, actually, I, I'm, I'm seeing your slides. I guess uh, there are some issues concerning some participant and it's recommended in these cases to log out and log in again because it's a connection is issue of some participant. It's not a general one, please. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I continue. Uh, these are three years, uh, Actually, uh, the anomaly was much larger than usual, 2016, 1998, 1983. So one can uh, ask what happened in these years. And actually, if we look the behavior of the ENSO index, which is represented in the small figure in the top, ENSO means El Nino Southern Oscillation, so El Nino is a phenomenon in which the sea surface in the tropical Pacific Ocean is interacting with the atmosphere. And actually you can see that the red curve shows three peaks exactly in that year, so 2016, 1998 and 1982, uh, 83. Actually 1983 is the highest peak so that the El Nino phenomenon was very intense in 1983. But if you take the list of the tem temperature anomaly, which is in the table in the left part, you can see that, uh, for instance, 1998 is the only year belonging to the previous millennium, which is entered in the list of the warmest years, all other warmest years belong to the to this millennium, 2016, 2020, 2019, 2015, all is 2000 something, but the 1998, which is in 11 position. The 1983 is in the 30 position. I put 30 lines in order to see also the 1983, but uh, please consider that if this year we will have a summer warm as the 1983, all the world will consider this year as a very cold year, because now we are accustomed to much higher temperature. Actually, the fact that uh, this interannual variation are overimposed that to a rising trend is the reason for which every time that you have another strong El Nino condition, you get a new maximum. So now we are expecting a new maximum in the next five to six years, and this will be a new record year. Oh. This slide has the reason to show you that despite that this information is very important because it shows you the behavior of the average global temperature, but the average global temperature is just 
one part of the information, but you need also to see how the, um, the distribution is uh, changing. But unfortunately, I cannot uh, run the movie here. So uh, I will skip this uh, slide. What uh, about Italy? Italy is interesting because uh, Italy is a very small country in the world and most of you are not from Italy, but just to see that uh, sometimes if you take, if you consider one individual nation, you can see some uh, climate variation that are not exactly the same as the global mean. For instance, in the case of Italy, this is the, the variation during the last two centuries from 1800 to today. Uh, actually, at the first glance, uh, you can see that the variation is very similar to the one that you have seen in the previous records. Especially, it is very similar the warming rate in the last part of the figure. But actually, uh, I wanted to point out one fact that if you consider the vertical scale of this figure, you can see that the variation of temperature since 1975 is about 1.7 Celsius degree in this figure. If you go in the previous figure, since 1975 to now, you have a variation of about 0.6 to 0.7 Celsius degree. So in Italy, we have a warming trend but the absolute value of this trend is two times the global anomaly. And Italy is not an exception. You can see the same result if you look the temperature variation in Spain or in France or in Greece or in almost every country which is located near the Mediterranean Sea. So Mediterranean region show a trend of temperature increment which is much higher than the global mean. Uh, there is not only the Mediterranean in this situation, but uh, uh, there is a, a number of regions, another region in which you have a warming trend very high, much higher than the global average, is the polar region, Arctic region. This uh, place, uh, they are called the uh, hot spot by the climatologist. And this is a joke because hot, because you have a high temperature variation and the hot spot also because it seems is more sensible to the warming. Just a short look about the precipitation in Italy. You have already seen something uh, for precipitation in Torino, that was the winter precipitation and in Torino winter precipitation did not change so much. Actually, if we enlarge the look at the, at the national scale, we can see that there is actually some trend. The trend is more evident in the summer, but also in annual value, you can see a very light decreasing trends. Here, precipitation are expressed in a percentage because in this case, it's more easy to compare different locations which have different amount of precipitation in the year. So if you calculate the trend uh, here, you can see that uh, the variation is about minus 10% per century. But you can also see that the signal show very large interannual variability. This is a national scale, but still there is a very large interannual variability. And this is a characteristic of precipitation. Actually, you will find variation like this almost in every nation in the world, in the sense that almost everywhere the interannual variability of this uh, variable is much larger than any trend. So uh, it is very difficult to assess the trend because of this variability. But uh, 
in Italy, we, can, we have another way to measure the impact of precipitation, and this is to measure the, the load, the amount of water brought by the rivers. And here in the table, I put the example of the Po River, and uh, about all variable related to the flow of the Po River, which is the largest Italian river, show a decrease of about uh, 9 to 12 percent. So this is compatible with the decrease in the precipitation trend of about 10 percent. So even if the signal can be considered statistically not significant, but the effect of the precipitation variation you can find in the river flow. So they can be important. And you can shift this discussion in some nation in which already now there is a water resource shortage. So it is necessary to consider even this variation, even if they are not statistically significant. So I have presented some climatic variation. I don't want to spend more. Maybe my colleague will introduce something more local in the next two hours. But I want also to discuss about the cause, the reasons of this variation. And why not taking the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel of Climatic Change report, the assessment report number five, it is written clearly that the human activity are the reasons for which the climate is changing during the 20th century. And actually, this is not a news because one century before, this guy, the Nobel Prize Svante Augusta Renius, published a paper in which he said that the emission of greenhouse gas and particular CO2 could produce in the global temperature of the earth. And he also tried to quantify the variation. Actually, the, the number were a little bit wrong, but the effect was clearly indicated and founded by him. His paper published in the 1895 year, as you can see here, uh, was the first paper in which it was quantified the greenhouse effect and the, the effect on the temperature. But uh, as you can see in this table, Arrhenius was not the first to discover this. The first was Fourier to theorize the effect of greenhouse gas on the global temperature, and after him also Tyndall, and after Arrhenius, many other scientists developed some, developed some research about the effect of greenhouse gas. So uh, actually, when the IPCC was created in 1988, actually there was a a group, a very big group of research that already discussed the, the problem of the greenhouse effect, which was increasing. Oh, this, uh, I, I will skip this, uh, but I will uh, point out on the killing. Killing is very important because he was the guy who decided to put the first observatory in the world on the Mauna Loa mountain in the US. So the observatory of uh, Mauna Loa was the first one to measure carbon dioxide, the CO2, in the world. And uh, this uh, series that you are seeing in this graph is the longest series in the world. And is uh, undoubtedly showing that the carbon dioxide concentration are increasing at the rate which is uh, almost exponential. What is the greenhouse effect? I mentioned it many times. 
Greenhouse effect uh, take the name from the greenhouse because uh, effect can be considered a little bit similar to what happened in the greenhouse. As you can see in the figure in the bottom, in a greenhouse, solar radiation can enter without any obstacle. And then solar radiation hit the soil and hit also the vegetation. And uh, the reflection is absorbed by the walls of the greenhouse. And uh, so the radiation remain trapped inside the greenhouse. So the temperature inside the greenhouse will increase. Actually, in the atmosphere, it happens something similar in the sense that solar radiation can enter into the atmosphere with a very short absorption. So it arrives to the terrestrial surface. It is absorbed by the earth, by the land and ocean, and is returned back as infrared radiation. But infrared radiation is trapped by the atmosphere because greenhouse gas can absorb this infrared radiation. So the greenhouse effect is due to the absorption of infrared radiation by the atmosphere. The difference with the greenhouse is that in the greenhouse, you have no vertical movement of air because the greenhouse is closed, but actually atmosphere is open. So you have a vertical movement of air. Anyway, the name derived from this consideration. Uh, what yes, is? I'm sorry, Claudio. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. If it is fine for you, uh, we can have a 10 minutes break for questions. Okay. Let me just conclude uh, this slide Absolutely. Uh, because uh, we talked about the greenhouse effect. I wanted to mention what is uh, the influence of greenhouse effect so to quantify the importance of greenhouse effect let's consider one earth without any greenhouse gas in this earth the average temperature is minus 18 degree if we include the greenhouse gas with the concentration at the beginning of industrial revolution temperature of the earth became plus 14 celsius degree so the difference is 32 degree more if we in increment the greenhouse gas with the anthropic emission temperature became 15 degrees so one degree more so one degree more is the contribution of uh, uh, human activities to the greenhouse effect the 32 degree more is the contribution of the natural greenhouse gas. Uh, and this contribution is very important because we can survive in the earth. Actually, maybe with a temperature of minus 18 degree, life could not have developed. But with a temperature of plus 14 degree, life would develop. Now we are altering the temperature by just one degree. It can it can seem a very small quantity, but uh, I want you to reflect about this. Uh, let's consider our body. Typical temperature of our body is 37 degrees if we stay well. But if we get a light COVID infection, temperature can become 38 degree. And we just one degree more, but uh, our health is not so good. So one degree can matter as a difference. Okay, so I will stop here. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so please, if there are questions or comments, uh, you can uh, can write as usual in the in the chat tool, or okay. you can you can open your your microphone and camera and ask directly to to Professor yes. Castato. Maybe I remove. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> no.
No question at all? Okay, maybe uh, I don't want to, to, to steal time to, to the lecture. Uh, if it is fine for you, Claudio, we can have a five minute break just of to, course. To, to drink yeah. uh, water and uh, re refresh a little bit. And then uh, we, we can resume the, the, the session. Yes, so sure. See you in, uh, in five minutes. Okay. Okay, buona lezione, Claudio. Okay, okay grazie. Welcome. Well, welcome again. And if it is okay for you, Claudio, I'm giving you the floor. Okay. Please confirm that you are seeing the slide and you listen to me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here in this slide, I, sh I put the variation of uh, the three main greenhouse gas in which there is a entropic contribution. The, the most important greenhouse gas is water vapor, but this cannot be modified directly by humans. So normally we consider as a constant or uh, dependent on the temperature. Of course, if temperature changes, it changes also the content of water vapor globally in the earth. But uh, regarding the other greenhouse gas, uh, here there is the three most important carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, and uh, uh, nitrogen protoxide, N2O. And you can see that uh, in all three cases, uh, there is uh, uh, a change of the concentration, which started in the 18th century. And uh, it became very evident in the 19th century and especially in the 20th century. Uh, the rate of increment is almost exponential for the carbon dioxide and also for the N2O. While for the methane, there is a slowdown of increment just for 20 years between 1985 and 2005. But now the concentration has restarted to grow almost exponentially. Uh, here you can see the a table from the IPCC report. I wanted to concentrate in the three in the pa uh, bottom part of the figure in which you can see the contribution of uh, anthropogenic radiative forcing due to to the all element but uh, between the all element uh, uh, greenhouse gas is the major component and uh, you can see how comparing 1950 1950 and 2011 which was the last year considered in this report the um, radiative factor was uh, increased so much so that the, the variation uh, was uh, almost four times bigger in just 60 years of time. So this means that the, the quantity of radiation trapped by the greenhouse effect increased by human uh, contribution was very large. The number can, can seem also in this case modest, but it's more than sufficient to explain the increment of temperature. Actually, I wanted to, I, I, I put a, a part uh, related to the emissions. Here you can see uh, a map in which they are shown the emission nation per nation, but they are per capita CO2 emissions. So you can see something quite strange in in the sense that uh, of course uh, the the nation which have the largest emission are in located in the north american continent in uh, arabic peninsula australia uh, part of asia and the, the the bigger part is the russia actually also europe has uh, not uh, not um, forgiven emissions but uh, there is a many nation, especially in Africa, South America, in which emissions are quite low. Of course, I am still 
mm, concentrating on per capita emissions. Uh, why we produce CO2 and we put the CO2 in the atmosphere? So which are the reasons for which we produce the CO2? Actually, there is a five reasons. Production of energy, this is the main source. And the uh, second reason is agriculture. And in agriculture, it's considered everything uh, because uh, we produce food for direct eating, but we produce also food for animal and then we eat the animal. And also it's considered uh, the CO2 needed for instance, to the insemination of the fields uh, and uh, for the yield uh, and the, for the transportation of food. Uh, so everything is included in agriculture. Agriculture is responsible of about one quarter of the total emissions of CO2 in the world. Energy production is about one third. Uh, one fifth is the contribution of industry and uh, 14% is the contribution of the transportation for humans and uh, much less than 6% is uh, the contribution of construction, which is mostly concrete. This is the reason for which we produce CO2. When we talk about uh, to have a, a world of emissions zero, it means we need uh, to put to zero all of this production of carbon dioxide. As you can imagine, it's not that easy. And uh, regarding where CO2 is going once we emit it in the atmosphere, actually I will show you the three numbers in the left figure in the bottom part. So there is uh, about 40, 47% which is uh, uh, actually remaining in atmosphere. The other part is uh, captured by the vegetation. 27% is used by vegetation for the photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is uh, absorption of uh, CO2 and the water to produce the sugar and then to produce uh, the part of the plants. And the remaining 26% is uh, directly stored, absorbed by the oceans. Ocean is a fluid and the fluid can absorb CO2. You know this very well because uh, I think everybody of you know what Coca-Cola, Coke is. Coke is uh, a fluid with uh, addition of CO2 inside. And uh, the problem of the ocean is uh, that the absorption capacity depends on temperature. And uh, you, you know also this very well, because if you take a cocker bottle from the refrigerator, you can open without any problem. But if you take a cocker bottle in the environment uh, temperature, if you open, you make a shower of coke in your body because uh, CO2 is exiting because it's not absorbed anymore. So even the just one degree of increment of global temperature has already altered the capacity of the ocean to absorb CO2. And because in the future it is predicted that temperature will change more, it is possible that the capacity of the ocean to store CO2 will decrease. And if ocean don't absorb CO2, this CO2 remain in the atmosphere. So concentration can grow even more. Oh, here I put uh, some slides to see what happened during the last years, last one and a half years, uh, in which we have uh, the pandemic situation of COVID-19. So uh, in these three graphs, uh, you can see that uh, practically during 2020, we have of course no data for the 2021 and not yet, but during 2020, there was a, a strong decrease of emission. Actually, 
if you see the curve, you can see that the, a decrease like the one from 2019 to 2020 is not present in the years before. So the, the decrease was very strong. And uh, you can see in the figure in the right uh, that it was very sharp in the first part of the year. And uh, in the bottom figure, you can see that the, the decrease was concentrated in the spring. In the spring, because many nations declared the lockdown during the spring of 2020, limiting the transportation. And this was the, the most important reason for the decrease of emission. So most of the emission were decreased in the transportation sector. Other sector like uh, house heating had uh, a very small increase because uh, the first months, the first two months of lockdown were still months in which heating system were open. So people remaining home, they used more the heating system. But in the transportation sector, the decrease was very strong. And uh, if you see the, the graph in the bottom, you can see that uh, in December of 2020, the variation was again positive. So after the end of the pandemic situation, the emissions were positive with respect to the year before. So uh, we returned back to the situation in which uh, emission increase year by year, so which is shown very clearly in the figure in the top of the page. And uh, this regards the emission. So how much uh, CO2 has been stored, has been emitted in the atmosphere? Uh, what about the concentration? So I take uh, the figure from the WMO, State of Global Climate in 2020, and uh, at the first at the first glance, uh, you by just looking the time trend of the three important uh, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen protoxide. Sorry for the protoxide, which is Finnish in the wrong figure. Uh, anyway, you cannot see an evident change in the concentration behavior, but we can analyze. Uh, more clearly by looking the uh, increment uh, from an year from one year to the previous year and uh, by comparing what happened in 2020 with the previous years we can see that uh, regarding concentration co2 show an increment and 2020 was much similar to the previous years the peak you have seen between 2015 and 2020 correspond to the year 2016. 2016 is the warmest year, if you remember. So also concentration of CO2 showed the, the biggest value. So the rate of increment was the largest in 2016. Then slowed down because of La Nina condition, but then started to rise again in 2020. So concentration did not show anything special in 2020. And the same as regard for the methane, which is the central figure, and the nitrogen protoxide, which is the right figure. In each case, in the recent 10 years, you can see a slow increment of concentration. So despite the, 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 the variation, negative variation of the emissions, we did not see any variation in the concentration amount. These two graphs uh, report the situation in Mauna Loa in the left and the, the global CO2 in the right. And again, by comparing 2020 with the previous years, you can see that there is no important variation in the growth of the concentration. So concentration are still growing, which means that the, 
decrease of emission during the pandemic situation was unprecedented, but still much, much low of what is needed to produce a decrease in the concentration. Okay, now I want to just introduce for one moment the climate model, but I don't talk anymore because maybe Elisa will talk more about the models. I want just to say that to infer the climate in the future and also nowadays to analyze the past and the present climate, we use numerical models. Numerical climate models are very important because they can be used as a, an instrument of laboratory to, mm, to see what happened. A model can describe the situation much more clear and uh, for instance, a model can give the data for every grid point and the number of grid point is much larger than the number of observation in the earth, especially for the past climate. So we can use the model as an instrument to have a more precise observation even in the past or present uh, situation. Also, we can use uh, so as a prognostic tool for the future climate in which, of course, we have no observation. One important thing uh, uh, is uh, to see the effect of uh, the anthropic increment of concentration of greenhouse gas. In this figure, you have a two, two, the figure is divided into parts. Left figure is a, uh, contain uh, three different things. One is the black line. The black line represented the observation of temperature expressed in anomaly from 19 to now, 1900 to now. The individual yellow line represented the simulation of one particular model. Here, uh, in, we have many hundreds of simulation by many hundreds of different models. And the red line is the average of all the model simulation. If you compare the red line with the black line, you can see that the models are able to represent the trend of the data. Sometimes model cannot reproduce perfectly some individual variations. So for instance, the jump you get around the 1940 as not represented by the model, but the trend in the first part of the century is well captured by the model, and especially the trend in the second part of the century has been well captured by the model. So, which is the difference between the two figures, left and right? The difference is about the input of greenhouse gas given to the models. In the left part, we give the observation of greenhouse gas, so the real condition. In the right, in the right part, we removed from the natural oscillation the trend. So we give substantially an almost constant uh, greenhouse gas concentration with interannual variation but uh, the trend was not existing. And you can see in the right figure, again, uh, the figure is like the, the left one. So the black line are the data, the uh, blue line are the individual simulation for each model, and the dark blue line is the average of all the model simulation. You can see that especially since 1960, the model is not following any more the data. So if we use a natural forcing by uh, greenhouse, concent greenhouse gas concentration, which have no trend of increase, the model cannot represent the, the real evolution of the data. This is an example uh, of the use of model as a diagnostic tool. 
So for instance, here we did an exercise of attribution by changing the greenhouse gas concentration and watching what happened to the model simulation. Oh, just uh, I wanted to tell this to explain what we can do for the future simulation. Of course, in the future, we don't have any observation of greenhouse gas. We can just uh, make a hypothesis about what, how the emission can change. And actually, IPCC decide to reunit hypothesis in four different possibilities. Possibility number one is we cut down the emission, we reduce the emission. In this case, it means that uh, evolution of the society became more responsible and trying to limit as much as possible the emission of greenhouse gas. Hypothesis number two and three are intermediate. We reduce emission, but not that much. Hypothesis number four, we do nothing. So emission will continue to rise without any control, almost exponential. You can see here in the four figure, which represent emission for CO2, methane, protoxic of uh, nitrogen and uh, other variable, that uh, there is a fork of value according to the scenario. The scenario has been named the RCP, representative concentration pathway, with a number associated. The number is uh, the radiative factor, so the amount of solar radiation trapped by the greenhouse gas. The number is increasing according to the concentration of greenhouse gas. Here is the concentration, which result for each scenario. And uh, the scenario mitigation scenario is the most optimistic one in which uh, the, the concentration will decrease at the end of this century. The stabilization scenario, uh, at the end of the century, you go close to the maximum concentration. And the first one is the business as usual, uh, in which you continue to have exponential increase of emissions and exponential increase of concentration. And this is the effect on temperature. Temperature change, as you can see, according to the scenario, the color is the same of the previous slide. So, uh, if you go in, uh, to the most extreme scenario, you have an increment of temperature, which is much larger. Here, the color is, uh, the color is associated to the scenario. The smallest line are the individual model simulation. The darkest line is the average of the smallest line, scenario by scenario. And you can see that the temperature increment will uh, rose from 1.5 Celsius degree with respect to the zero, which is the average of the pre-industrial period, up to five degree of global mean. Five degree of global mean, which is a dramatic scenario in the case of business as usual concentration pathway. Oh, I will skip this. I want uh, to give an idea also about another things. When we say global mean temperature, uh, usually this is just a part of the result, but uh, what we need is uh, to have a, an instantaneous uh, image which show local change. And here I put a map for the worst scenario, the business as usual, for temperature in the right part and the precipitation in the left part. As you can see, regarding temperature, the worst scenario will produce an increment of temperature that in some part of the Mediterranean region and also in Russia uh, will uh, produce an increment of five degree, uh, even at the national level. Uh, on an annual basis. Regarding precipitation, it's interesting to see that uh, 
Okay. First of all, I, I want to mention one thing. In a warmer world, you can expect more water vapor. More water vapor, it means potentially more cloudiness, so more precipitation. But this globally. Locally, you can have some area with a large increment of precipitation, but some other area with a decrease of precipitation because of climatic interaction. And you see perfectly this in the left map. I tracked one yellow line. Above this yellow line, the precipitation show an increment, increment which arrive to even to 15% or 20% of precipitation more than now. Below that line, you can see a decrease of precipitation, especially in uh, Iberic Peninsula, Italy, North Africa, and also uh, Greece, Turkey, and uh, this kind of nation. So all the Mediterranean region show a decrease of the precipitation, and the signal is considered significant and robust. This is uh, the same map of uh, precipitation change, but divided by season. JJEA means summer, June, July, August. SON means autumn, September to November. Uh, DJF means winter, December to February. And uh, MAM means spring, March to May. As you can see, respecting to the global map in which you had uh, the line of 0% change of precipitation exactly on the Alps and the Pyrenees. Here, this line is moving according to the season. In particular, if you look in summer, which is the first JJA map, you can see that most of Western Europe and the Mediterranean is in a draft situation because the percentage of precipitation is decreasing sometimes even by 20%. So this is a very important signal which can be can have some big consequence. So not only temperature variation but also precipitation distribution. Uh, here are other maps. For instance, this is correlated with the before one. This is the length of the draft periods now and in the future. And if you compare the 30 years of the last of the end of the century with the situation in the 30 years beginning this year, you can see that the situation in the worst scenario will be much worse. So the number of draft days can increase even by 30 days. 30 days is one month more. So uh, in a case of agriculture and production in all these nations, with the red color, we need to irrigate one month more to keep the agricultural production constant. Uh, I will skip this two slide and I will concentrate about the effect on the territory. One effect, it is very debated that this effect is the increase of climatic extreme. Uh, it's very debated why, because we are talking about extreme weather. Extreme weather means heavy precipitation, so, which produce flooding, uh, for instance, hail, tornado, hurricane, but also draft conditions, and also heat waves or cold waves. So all of these are part of extreme climate. And because they are extreme, their number is normally very low. So we need to make statistics with an ensemble which contain very small numbers. So frequently, it's very difficult to have sufficient statistics. So it's very difficult to establish some trend which are statistically significant 
to be considered a real trend. So this is why we have a large debate about this, but uh, sometimes, especially for, for uh, extremes regarding precipitation, uh, we have no conclusion anymore. The only uh, sector in which we have uh, already some conclusion is the sector related to temperature, because, for instance, the trend related to heat wave is already clear in the present climate and will continue to be clear also in the future climate. The number of heat waves will increase. The, in the future climate, heat waves will be more numerous, so we will have more case and also will be stronger. So the intensity of the heat waves will be larger than now. Regarding precipitation, we expect an increase of the number of cases of violent precipitation or also strong hurricanes or typhoon or even severe weather, so violent thunderstorms. But uh, I think we need uh, some more time to have uh, this uh, statistic become uh, statistically significant. Uh, Okay, I skipped some slide because I I, I was uh, slowest than expected. What which are other effects uh, about uh, of this uh, climate variation on the on the life, for instance? One effect is uh, regarding biodiversity. Biodiversity is decreasing uh, because uh, some. Uh, particular species are more vulnerable to climate change. Climate change, if you just consider the increment of temperature, uh, sometimes uh, vegetation cannot adjust in time to the new temperature. Vegetation cannot walk, so uh, the procedure to move uh, for the vegetation is very complicated. And sometimes climatic variation is too fast, so vegetation cannot follow. But uh, for animal is more simple, but uh, sometimes animals are related with vegetation. So if, if a vegetation extinguish, also animal can extinguish. But uh, there, are, there are some other more subtle variation. For instance, uh, some animal have the reproduction time exactly in time with the flowering of some plant. If climatic change make alteration on the date of flowering and on the date of animal reproduction, this, uh, this uh, correspondence can vanish in the future climate and so both species can uh, have a big problem. Uh, another effect is the rise of sea level. Rise of sea level occur for two reasons. One is the ice melting, ice melting especially in Antarctica and Greenland. Another reason is thermal expansion of water. If you warm the water, water expands its volume. So sea level is increasing. At now, half of uh, uh, the three millimeter per year of uh, increase of sea level is due to thermal expansion and half to the ice melting. In the future, ice melting can become uh, prevailing, especially from uh, Greenland. Greenland, as uh, it is shown in this image, uh, the ice is melting with uh, very quickly and uh, in practice, uh, just the central part of Greenland is uh, remaining uh, with the temperature below zero for the complete year, uh, while uh, the coastal area uh, have a positive temperature during summer, so melting can uh, start uh, during the warmest months. So the, the ice will go in the ocean and contributing to the increase of the level. Also, the ice present on the sea is melting. This is as a not, uh, is not important for the sea level because uh, the ice already on the sea will not uh, 
even if it melts, will not alter the, the sea level, but it's very important for the albedo effect because ice is white and reflect the global, the solar radiation. If ice melt, the sea surface is uh, very dark and absorb solar radiation. So if uh, Arctic sea ice disappear, the Arctic uh, sea will, uh, uh, how to say, absorb more solar radiation and uh, this will produce a, a further increment of temperature. Uh, in the mountain, the change are more, bigger than in the other part of the planet. We can, we, we know very well here in, uh, in Piemonte, uh, for who is not Italian, Piemonte is an Italian word which means pie means piede, foot, monte means mountain. So that the name of the region is at foot of the mountain because a mountain composes the 60% of the territory of the, the region. So they are very important. And uh, we saw many effects of climate change in our mountains. Effect very complex, not only glacial retreat, but uh, also permafrost degradation and uh, the amount of snow in the soil is changing and the number of days in which we have snow in the soil is decreasing. And this produces a big change in ecosystems. I want to, to show just two photos to see how the glacier are retreating. And uh, in particular, these three photos, uh, you can see the same glacier, but I wanted to concentrate in the last two because you can see very large variation in just 10 years. And these other photos are mine. And uh, so recently you can see huge variation in a very short time. So the same person can see the change during its life. In the past, uh, to make a comparison, you needed to search a, a postcard of the last century. And then you can see very big difference. But nowadays it's just sufficient to wait uh, uh, 10 years or 15 years and you can see already the big difference. This is a very important, for instance, regarding the, uh, the change of ecosystem in mountain. Mountain usually have a conic shape like this. So ecosystem are divided according to the, to the elevation. If uh, temperature is rising, ecosystem should move to the height. But uh, this is the, the, the biggest problem. Uh, as you can see by this image, ecosystem can move to the upper part of the mountain, but the area is reducing. For instance, look here, the area in which you have a pine trees is much smaller in the new configuration. So there is a less space. So this contributes, is contributing to the decline of the biodiversity. And also consider that uh, the organisms who live in the highest part of the mountain have no space to move and they are condemned to extinguish. Of course, if something extinguished, some other animal or plant is replacing. So we have a new invasion of new species which are taking the place of all the species which are already disappeared or moved in other parts. Here is an example. I am sorry for the Italian name of the species, but sometimes I don't know the name in English. Uh, I wanted to almost conclude my talking uh, regarding agricultural productivity. The first slide I, I show you is uh, this one, and uh, here you can see the situation of the future productivity predicting according to climate models for Africa and for Europe. The figures are taken by two different uh, places. So they are not exactly showing the same uh, 
the same information, but uh, in any case, uh, the area in Africa with the red color represent a place in which the agricultural productivity for the uh, middle of this century, it is expected to decrease by 50%. So near the Sahara Desert, uh, we can have uh, a sharp decrease of productivity also near the Kalahari and Namibia desert of about 50 percent. But even if you look in Europe, you can see that uh, Spain, France, Italy, Greece, and uh, in part also Turkey will have a strong decrease of productivity, not like uh, uh, Saharan regions, but uh, anyway, which is uh, uh, ranging from uh, 15 to 25 percent less, uh, and in Spain, even more, more than 35 percent less. So, this uh, decrease of agricultural productivity, uh, you need to consider that uh, human population will increase in any case, but if you decrease the agricultural productivity, this can become a very big problem. Uh, this is the situation in the world. And uh, of course, uh, the decrease of productivity is different according to the species. But uh, in this uh, simulation performed by the International Food Policy Research Institute, you can see that, for instance, for corn, the decrease of productivity between 2000 and 2050 is of about 25 percent and the corn is mostly produced in uh, in america continent so this can be a potential problem which we need to face and uh, regarding italy our study showed that we expect the soil moisture decrease very much during summer during winter almost no change or as low increase, but during summer in the Po Valley, including Torino City, we will have a, a short a strong decrease of soil moisture, which means that if you want to keep the production of agriculture, you need to irrigate. You need to irrigate about one month more. And this is another study we performed in our region, is related to the wine. Maybe most of you don't like or don't use wine, but uh, for our region, wine is very important for economy. And uh, if we analyze it, the last 60 years, we can see that the alcoholic, the sorry, the sugar content of the grape was increased very much, especially in the last 30 years from 1980 to 2010. And uh, the vegetation phase were anticipated about two weeks for the flowering and about one and a half months for the maturation of the grape. So this is a signal of the effect of climate change on the vegetation phase. In this case, it's specific for vineyards, but similar figure can be also derived for other species. Regarding wine, uh, for us, it will be a big problem. Uh, the red area represents the regions in which wine is produced now, but according to the climate change, may be not produced in the future. And you can see that most of Italy is in the red color. And the blue represent the area in which now is, it is not produced wine, but in the future it can be produced. And you can see that the most of North Europe, including England, will become a region very good for the production of wine. So this can be problematic. And uh, I repeat, uh, this is uh, related to the wine, but uh, we can have a similar figure for other plants so that the discussion is quite similar so sometimes we need to consider for the climatic change we expect in the future that we need to change some cultivation 
Now, I want to dedicate three slides about the problem of pollution. I, I saw a comment during the previous break in which somebody uh, told me about the pollution in Torino, Torino city, but generally in North Italy. Pollution is a very big problem. And there is a something which correlates pollution with climate change. First, uh, we need to consider why we have pollution in uh, Western Mediterranean areas, especially in the city. The reason is, uh, in, in, at first, uh, we have pollution normally in winter. And uh, we have pollution in winter during clear sky condition when the, we have a high pressure. The reason is that in high pressure condition, we have an inversion layer above the city. Uh, the, the, the depth of this inversion layer is just a few tenths of meter, but in the inversion layer, we have no exchange of air in the vertical. So all the pollution emitted by the city remain in the city. So the concentration of pollution is increasing. If high pressure condition lasts for one week, the pollution emitted by the city in one week is continuing to remain in the city. And this can become a very big problem of pollution. This situation is typical of high pressure condition. Uh, and uh, the photo in the right is the typical photo of the Torino city taken from the hills. You can see very clearly the layer of pollution, which is uh, above the city. Why is this related to the climate? This is, in the left, you have the general circulation. You can see that in North Africa, there is the word height. This is the position where normally, especially in winter, you have a high pressure area. Sometimes, uh, this high pressure can uh, move to the Mediterranean and uh, hit also Italy. With the climate change, the, the cell of Hadley, in which the border is the position of high pressure area, is moving north. And uh, in the right figure, it is uh, represented the variation of pressure in the last 30 years, uh, respecting to the previous 30 years. The red area represents uh, an increase of pressure. So that means uh, that considering this as a climatic figure, uh, in the last 30 years period, uh, it is, uh, the pressure is higher than in the previous 30 years, which means that uh, we can have uh, more situation of high pressure and uh, in the same situation of high pressure pressure will be higher so more intense or more long situation of high pressure conditions so pollution is getting worse this is uh, the relation the link between uh, climate change and pollution and uh, as you can see the maximum of the red area is exactly between uh, Spain, France, and North Italy. So these are the area most affected by this uh, change of pressure. Uh, let me use two minutes more, uh, almost the uh, end of my speech, but uh, what to do? Uh, what to do? Let's uh, start uh, by saying, Sorry. By saying what uh, has been decided in the Paris Agreement. In the Paris Agreement, uh, during the COP Conference of Party number 21, it has been decided to try to cut the emissions in order to keep the level of temperature below two Celsius degree above the pre-industrial levels and if possible, to try to keep below 1.5 Celsius degree. So uh, the limit is two degree, but uh, it is better to try to remain 
below 1.5 degree. This is because uh, the effects of keeping temperature just 1.5 degree above the pre-industrial level with respect to keeping two degree will be less uh, numerous and uh, less impacting. What to do to get this objective? Uh, try to reducing up to the end of uh, to the middle of the century emissions by 40 70 percent and uh, arrive to zero emission in uh, the end of the centuries this is the recipe to the prescription to get this objective this uh, is what has been decided in the paris agreement at now the number of nations which signed the paris agreement uh, is not complete, still some nations are out of the Paris Agreement. And uh, for the moment, every nation which uh, uh, signed the Paris Agreement promised some reduction of the emissions. But if we sum all the promise of the old nation, this number is not sufficient to to arrive to the objective. So we need to do more. Uh, what, uh, what uh, if we do nothing, if we don't respect the Paris Agreement? Uh, there is a lot of place in the web in which you can make this kind of joke. So for instance, uh, to see what will be the climate in the end of the century in your location and uh, the algorithm is searching another location in the world which will have the same climate now and for instance for torino we find that the the city in which the future climate of torino will resemble the actual climate now is karachi and karachi actually has a temperature of larger than the one in torino of course this is the uh, result of the worst scenario, but uh, we need to consider. Uh, here, I want to skip something. I like this figure because uh, here you have the list of all the meetings starting from the Rio summit and then all the conference of party, the first one in Berlin up to the last one. And uh, overimposed, uh, there is uh, the trend of CO2, which uh, continue to grow. In the beginning, uh, Rio summit was the conference number zero. And the last one um, should be this year in 2021, but uh, at the end of the year, last year, due to the COVID, uh, that was not uh, held. And during this long period of about 50 years between the Rio summit to today, the increment of CO2 was about uh, 50 parts per million. During this conference, uh, it was a continuous debate year by year. New evidence came, discussion were very strong, very long, conclusion very few. There was uh, the Kyoto Agreement, then there was uh, the Paris Agreement, and then we hope that uh, in the future we can have a less discussion and a more actions. Uh, I wanted to show you also this one. Sorry. Uh, I, okay, anyway, this is my calculation. Uh, the actual concentration of CO2 is 414 parts per million. According to the Paris Agreement, we need to remain 450 parts per million. If we divide by the increment rate that actually is close to 3 ppm per year, you can have an idea of about how many years you have time to do something in order to reduce the emission and try to slow down the increment of concentration. Uh, we already saw during the COVID that reducing the emission by 
four gigaton of CO2 is not sufficient to influence the concentration. So we need to reduce more. And uh, uh, so this is uh, the uh, the receipt. What we can do, but uh, there is many actions even individual can do to try to cut down the emissions. But some actions have a very small impact. Some actions have moderate impact. Some actions have a high impact. Of course, uh, some action can have uh, some other negative uh, problem. For instance, here you can see that the action which uh, has uh, the largest contribution to reduce uh, the emissions is have a less child. Of course, this has uh, some uh, other problems correlated to because the age of population will increase if we have uh, less child. But uh, there is other action which uh, don't have any other problem correlated, like using less car or try to avoid the uh, airplane flight or do something in the house in order to reduce the consumption of energy in many possible ways. But in my opinion, one important thing to, to reach this objective is to do communication. And this is the reason for which even I am doing this kind of, of speech in the public because we need to raise the awareness of the public. The public must be aware of this problem and the need to talk with other people in order that the number of population which ask to do something to contrast climate change will increase in order they can influence the agenda of politicians. And if politicians decide to do something, they can do. So thank you for having listened to me. I think I can stop here, but I will be very happy to answer to your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you very much. Um, we are in here in now under a severe hailstorm. So also here we have a bad yeah. <laughs> Okay, there is a, a question from, uh, from Claudia. Uh, in different lectures, we have heard how agriculture has an important role in gas emissions. I just wanted to be sure if you are referring mainly to the case of industrial large scale agriculture, or do you also consider family farming as a cause of these emissions? Um, mm. Of course, uh, emissions uh, related to agriculture consider everything. And so they are both included in this. Uh, of course, uh, we consider agriculture for the moment in which you plant the seeds of the plants to the moment in which uh, the, the people is eating food. So everything is included in this sector. Uh, emissions uh, are still huge and also they consider irrigation because also we need a fossil fuel to support irrigation plant, to take the water from the rivers and to distribute in the fields. All this emit uh, greenhouse gas. So. When I say one quarter of the emission is due to the agriculture, it is considered altogether. Of course, also emission of the plants. For instance, uh, rice is a typical plant in which the, 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 the spoiled the part of the vegetation will produce methane during the, the last phase, for instance. And uh, all this is considered. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments concerning Professor Casado presentation? Yeah, uh, this Piusha, I wanted to comment with a reflection and wanted uh, uh, Professor to also comment on it. Uh, you know, especially when I look 
say in in in, in India, right? I guess also globally, one image that people associate with climate change is polar bears and uh, ice melting around the polar bears. Now it's a very distant image. It's it looks very exotic. It looks nice, but it's very distant. You can't relate it to what's happening in your immediate surroundings or in the area that you may have some influence. In the talk, you talked about wine and Italy. And I think as an example that touches um, people much more if you look at that landscape, you know, Europe or Italy. Um, what is, and, and I can think of maybe things in India that could do with certain mango species or you know, things that people are really passionate about and not necessarily driven by uh, polar bears that are really far away. What has your experience been um, on this aspect of what is it that we relate to or what is it that works more effectively as a tool for communication when it comes to this kind of association? Thank you. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> In some sense, uh, you are right, uh, in the sense that uh, when I speak about uh, variation in the uh, Arctic region, um, is, yes, I have in, in the mind the polar bears, but also other problems. But uh, you need to remember that, uh, uh, first of all, Arctic region is the place in the world in which variation of climate are largest. Second, uh, even if this can uh, is supposed to be an exotic region in which nobody lives, but what happens there can influence the climate everywhere. So even uh, climate variation in India uh, can be the consequence of what is happening in the Arctic region. Because if the Arctic Sea is disappearing and if Greenland is melting, this can produce a consequence all around the world. One consequence, for instance, can be the slowdown of the thermal circulation in the ocean. This can have some reflection of climate variation everywhere, not only in Europe, because of the transportation of heat uh, in the ocean in all the world can be influenced. Regarding other exotic fruit like mango, exotic for us. Uh, of course, uh, um, climate variation can be large. And uh, when I consider India, uh, of course, uh, uh, we can perform some study about the local agricultural production. So even tropical fruit, but uh, when I consider India and Bangladesh, uh, the most important climate consequence which uh, came to my mind is the, the the number of people which live now in the coastal areas, which are several millions of population, and the coastal area will be strongly influenced by the rise of sea level. So this population must live, must change the house and live somewhere else because that environment in uh, 20 or 30 years will be not uh, not anymore habitable because of the, it will be submerged by the sea. So this is the most dramatic consequence in my opinion. And this is a, is a result of something which is not occurring directly in India or Bangladesh, but is uh, occurring maybe elsewhere in other parts of the world. So climate is as a non-national boundaries. It's a, something which is related to all the earth. So we must pay attention to every part of the of, of our planet. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there is another question in the in the chat. Uh, I also believe that access to weather and climate information or simply Communication is key. How can we provide this kind of services to mountain communities? Oh, this is a good question, but uh, I think that, uh, um, yeah, 
information regarding that is very important and uh, i think that nowadays uh, at least in uh, developed country this information is already available in non non develop not yet developed countries the problem is uh, economic so i think that uh, there is no miss of information but uh, at least uh, there is uh, the necessity of communicate communication in my opinion is a global problem even in well developed countries we need to communicate the data and now we have the web and many um, possibility to have access of the data but we need to educate the population in interpreting the data now we are flooded about the meteorological information prediction and also climate information climate prediction but we need to educate the population and uh, in order that, that they can be able to distinguish the good information in my opinion this is most important okay okay thank you thank you very much uh, I'd like to thank professor Casado for this uh, interesting lecture and uh, okay if uh, it's fine for everybody we can have a 10 minute break so we can uh, we can switch to our uh, second lecturer. I will introduce you after the, the break. So thank you again, uh, Claudio, and uh, see you in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Grazie, Claudio. Okay, so welcome everybody, welcome again. We were discussing concerning the hailstorm is <laughs> affecting the Turin and this, uh, this, this moment, uh, but now it's time to, to to resume the, the lecture, and we we have switched the the, uh, the lecturer, and now I would I'm happy to welcome Professor um, Elisa Palazzi from the University of Turin, and uh, she will continue uh, lecturing us on climate change. So I'm giving floor to Elisa, please. Thank you very much, Danilo. Welcome everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me also this year. Uh, and thank you also to Claudio Cassardo for providing uh, a general overview on climate change. Uh, I will focus more in this, uh, in this talk on, on the mountains, trying to understand um, uh, the drivers of the observed and projected changes in the mountains and uh, the effects which uh, we are already observing. I will focus specifically on um, a phenomenon which is called elevation dependent warming and its extension, in a way, the elevation dependent climate change. Before uh, starting, uh, I would like to just to remember the, the, the context and especially uh, remembering to, to everyone why mountains are so important for everyone. Mountains are everywhere, in a way, at each latitude on Earth are globally distributed better and are transnational and they occupy about 25% uh, of the earth land surface and are home to the 20% of the world population. They are also home and house to uh, biodiversity. In fact, uh, uh, mountain regions are biodiversity hotspots, supporting about 25% of the terrestrial biodiversity of, on the earth. And last but not least, uh, about 30% of protected areas worldwide are located in mountain regions. Uh, mountains are very important, not only for the 20% of persons living there, but they are also crucial for people living uh, far from the mountains themselves, living downstream, because they provide a number of ecosystem services which we use for free in a way. What happens in the mountains does not stay in the mountains. Uh, there are three kinds, I would say, of services which are uh, delivered by the mountains, provisioning services like water, food, energy, timber, minerals, regulating services. Let's just think about the um, mountain component of the hydro hydrological cycle, uh, water storage, uh, the modulation of runoff regimes, Let's also think about the mitigation that the mountains offer to the risk from natural hazards. And uh, again, um, 
cultural services. Uh, mountains are also house of cultural heritage, spiritual value, aesthetic value, recreational activities, and diversity of cultures. So mountains are really important for all of us. And the importance of mountains has been also documented uh, and emphasized in uh, a number of international uh, initiatives and contexts. For example, in 1992, uh, at the Rio de Janeiro Air Summit, the Chapter 13 of the Agenda 21 confirmed the importance of mountains and the need of, for sustainable development in, in the mountains, given their uh, uh, crucial role as sources of water, energy, biodiversity, minerals, forest and agricultural products. In 2002, the United Nations declared the International Year of Mountains, and in 2019, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in its uh, special report on the ocean and the cryosphere in the changing climate, dedicated one entire chapter to high mountain areas for the first time in the IPCC history. So this confirms the importance that these environments have all in the research communities and, uh, of course, uh, uh, for the impacts um, of the consequences um, observed uh, in, in, these, in these important environments and downstream. Uh, so mountains are very important, but uh, they are also very fragile environments. They are very sensitive to climate and environmental changes and, and especially changes driven by anthropogenic actions, including water and air pollution, including changes in land use, including alien species. And all these changes have manifestations in, in the mountains that can be considered as common to many mountain regions, but also specific depending on the, on the mountain region which we are uh, studying. These changes affect the provision of ecosystem function and services, water quality and quantity, food production, um, and the society in general, including economic growth, of course. It is thus very essential and important to um, study, to understand, to monitor the mountain environments and to uh, better understand the mechanisms at play in these special environments, as well as the response to future climate conditions using, for example, uh, projections from state-of-the-art uh, global or regional uh, or local climate models. All these uh, changes which uh, we uh, are already observing and are projected to continue in the future, depending on the development, possible development of the society, affect many um, subsystems of the mountain climate, including the cryosphere, of course, with glaciers, snow, permafrost, including the atmosphere, with the occurrence of um, extreme events, for example, uh, the biosphere with the um, important changes in, in biodiversity and in general uh, with changes in uh, the functioning of mountain ecosystems. What are uh, the research needs? Research needs include, of course, the need to understand the key processes and mechanisms occurring in the mountains. In order to make reliable, reliable projections, we need to understand the, uh, the players and the um, mechanisms at play. And in order to do so, we need to improve both measurements and models. And we especially need to uh, integrate, in a way, the information coming from different kinds of observations and different kinds of models. Uh, in situ observations and earth system observations, especially from satellite, should be analyzed jointly in a way in order to exploit um, and to extract the maximum of information from both these sources. Um, homogenization of in situ in, in, in observations, designing of proper metadata on the existing information is essential in order to correctly use the data we are using because metadata tell uh, the history of the data themselves. Model simulations can be improved in different ways, for example, by increasing the spatial resolution of the, 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 the climate models, uh, spatial resolution, uh, a higher spatial resolution allows to better represent 
uh, the, the, the effects, for example, of the local forcing, so for example, of the topography, we, 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 we can uh, act on improving the parameterizations, which are used in the models to um, include in the description of the climate system all the processes which occur at a scale which is smaller than the model resolution. And we need to uh, also improve uh, uh, what we call the modeling chain uh, because uh, um, it is uh, probably better to use more than one model in order to better understand the key processes and the mechanisms. Each model has its own advantages and drawbacks. Modeling chains are built to, um, to link and to connect the large scale global climate models providing a, a global overview of the climate system and of its changes up to the very local uh, models uh, um, which are intended to um, provide the response of a very local system or process to a given external forcing. And another important topic uh, is uh, the um, uh, is to handle and possible, possibly to reduce the uncertainties which are inherent in both observations and in model simulations. I would like just to show you uh, very briefly the different kinds of observations that we can use uh, both in mountains and in, in general at the global level in order to analyze the current and future um, evolution of the climate system. In situ stations, of course, in situ stations uh, uh, have probably the longest uh, possible temporal coverage among the different uh, observation based data sets and are important because only in situ stations have the potential of characterizing the local, the very local conditions, but they are unevenly distributed and especially in the mountains, this is a, a, an important source of uncertainty. Um, the, 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 the observations in the mountains are often biased toward the lower elevations because most stations are located in valley floors rather than in mountain tops and, and slopes. Have a look just at the, at, at the figure in, in the upper right part of this slide. You can see the distribution of in situ stations uh, which are included in the GPCC row database. Um, and which are used and interpolated in order to build the GPCC interpolated data set. You can see by yourself that the reliability of the GPCC interpolated data set is, is probably much higher along the Malayan chain, for example, in the Tibetan plateau because of the lowest of the very low number of stations in, in the plateau with respect to uh, what we have, the situation which is encountered along the Himalayan chain. Then we have uh, also interpolated grid data sets, as already mentioned, they are based on the interpolation and gridding of in situ stations. Gridding um, on, the, on the one side reduces the biases arising from the, arising from the irregular station distribution and help in the analysis of regional trends, of course, um, these interpolated or grid data sets are also well comparable, for example, with the satellite data, um, which are also um, uh, provided on a regular, uh, on a spatial regular grid and with the outputs of numerical models. But of course, the poor spatial coverage and the sparseness of the underlying stations, just look at the GPC zero uh, station distribution, represents a big source of uncertainty when we interpolate grid point values from the nearest few available stations. Satellite data, satellite data uh, um, now um, are becoming very suitable also for assessing long-term trends and for performing climatological studies because they start around the 1980s. So we started to have a quite long temporal series in order to perform uh, statistically re relevant climate studies. They have a spatially complete coverage, so they are useful to have a homogeneous, in a way, picture of the situation without holes. But of course, uh, um, 
exactly like in situ stations, uh, uh, also the satellite observations uh, have some problems in measuring some components, for example, of the hydrological cycle in mountain environments like and precipitation, especially when the scene is uh, covered by clouds, for example. We can also rely on uh, merged in situ and satellite data sets. One, probably the most uh, famous, is the GPCP data set, uh, which combines, in a way, the good properties of in situ um, stations and satellite observations. And finally, reanalysis data. Um, the, the most recent uh, is the ERA 5 uh, data set provided by the ECNWF recently extended back to 1950, so a quite long um, time series. Reanalysis use uh, data simulation techniques to keep the output of a numerical model as close as possible to the observation. So reanalysis use uh, two uh, sources of information, both observations and models together. And in a way, reanalysis can be considered as an estimate of the climate of the past, past 50 or 60 or 80 years, which is sometimes better than the observations themselves. But of course, they include the possible uncertainties and errors which are inherent in both observations and model simulations. So sometimes this uh, output should be kept and regarded with some caution, especially when you use them to calculate uh, temporal trends. What about the models? I, I would like just to show you the already mentioned modeling chain, sometimes called also downscaling and impact chain. We have at the beginning of this chain, the global climate models whose uh, average resolution now is of about 80 kilometers, 75, 80, 90 kilometers. Um, regional climate models, the second step of the chain are nested into the global climate models, which provide the lateral and boundary condition for the regional stations. They, these simulations are performed over strict domains and thus they can be performed um, using a higher and finer spatial resolution in the order of 10 to 40 kilometers for the hydrostatic regional climate models. We, we have now, uh, um, experiments running in a non-hydrostatic way, uh, which means simply that the phenomena like the convection are explicitly resolved, are permitted within the simulation. And this can achieve a resolution in the order of one, two, three kilometers. Sometimes the resolution of regional climate models, especially the hydrostatic ones, uh, is not enough to drive a local or a process or a, an, an impact model, and we need to apply a further downscaling to the output of regional climate models, which can be statistical or stochastic. And uh, this further downscaling uh, allow us to produce climatic outputs um, at a resolution of about one kilometer or less in order to feed uh, local scale or impact models like eco-hydrological models, like landslide models, like flood models, uh, population dynamics model, and so on and so forth. I would like also to just to mention some of the weak points uh, in, in model simulation and formulation, which still exist, especially in the representation of the hydrological cycle and especially in the mountains. Hydrological processes are often crudely represented in the models. Future changes in some components of the hydrological cycle, even precipitation, but especially evapotranspiration, runoff, precipitable water, are not uh, captured in detail and are affected by large uncertainty. Changes in some uh, um, terrestrial components of the hydrological cycle, groundwater, snowmelt, wetlands, permafrost hydrology, are often or are still not tackled at all in the models. And finally, our anthropogenic influence, uh, irrigation and uh, river regulations, uh, uh, agricultural land use and management, management are important forcing uh, now, um, which uh, in a way um, uh, um, contribute to the, the changes which uh, are observed, but are not included uh, 
uh, in the models. So this is something which we will need to, of course, uh, improve. And again, for precipitation in particular, which is one of the most difficult variable, both to measure, especially in the mountains, and to model, uh, there are different possible sources of uncertainty related to the need to parameterize small scale um, processes as a function of the large scale processes, which we can explicitly uh, represent and reproduce in the models. Um, for example, one of the most important parameterizations which are related to the precipitation um, simulation is the convection parameterization. The resolution of the models is, of course, very important to better reproduce uh, uh, so intermit a variable like precipitation, which is highly intermittent and, and, and uh, uh, which uh, um, is characterized by a strong spatial and temporal variability and the influence of aerosol particles, which especially in certain areas of the globe uh, have an impact on the representation of precipitation. For example, in the Indian monsoon region, we know that aerosol particles, especially on short time scales, uh, really affect the monsoon dynamics. Uh, I will um, provide some example now, uh, starting from the global climate models, because these are the tools which uh, um, I've used more uh, in the past uh, years. And these are at the beginning of this modeling chain. So a better uh, understanding of how this GCM works work, and especially of how they reproduce certain variables, which uh, will be probably used then to, for example, uh, as boundary conditions for the regional climate models is, of course, of utmost importance. I will provide some example on uh, a particular process, uh, which is called elevation dependent warming, which is one of the most interesting um, mechanisms uh, occurring in the mountains and in the high elevation regions. Elevation dependent warming literally means that we observe some warming rates, some temperature trends, and we see that uh, they are not the same in different altitude ranges, but they can uh, be different in a statistically significant way. So elevation dependent warming does not necessarily mean uh, an amplification of warming rates with the elevation, even though Sometimes in the literature, it is assumed that EDW means uh, uh, amplification of warming rates with the elevation. It is uh, a phenomenon which is not very easy to study because of different uh, difficulties that we face. Uh, well, first of all, uh, on the observational side, we have um, sparseness or even the lack of long-term observations in the very high mountains especially uh, in some regions. So a number of stations above 4,000 meters is extremely lower than the number of stations uh, at uh, altitudes uh, below. There is also a lack of consistency in, in the methods which, which are currently used to quantify the elevation dependent warming because it, it is a quite recent, in a way, topic uh, which has been uh, studied by the community. The first uh, big review on, on, on this topic uh, uh, dates back uh, to 2015, hmm? six years ago. Uh, another difficulty arises from the fact that uh, uh, enhanced warming is usually occurring in response to many, many climate variables, which are still not well identified, at least all of them, which are correlated with each other um, and which uh, participate in feedback mechanisms. So it is a very complex um, mechanism and complicated by different factors. And also on the model side of the story, we have some difficulties because of things already mentioned before, because models need to be improved, especially in terms of um, spatial resolution and parameterization, and especially in the very complex terrains like the mountains. What we know um, on elevation dependent warming from the observations, a majority of observational studies suggests that uh, warming is more intense and more rapid and as we go higher in altitude in a given mountain range. However, uh, some studies do not show any relationship, any clear 
relationship between uh, warming rates on, uh, and the elevation. And other studies show more complex situations with, for example, non-linear relationship, curvilinear relationship, or increase uh, of the warming rates with the elevation up to a certain altitude, and then a decrease or then a stabilization. Here is just an example taken from the review mentioned before, Nature Climate Change 2015. Uh, taken from one of the regions, uh, the Tibetan Plateau Himalayas, showing the most striking evidence of elevation-dependent warming from the observations. For example, the, the figure on the right, which it is quite complex, has, has many, many elements within, but just consider, for example, the uh, brownish uh, line, um, which uh, evaluates the temperature trends from 1991 to 2012, saying that in this time period, the temperature has increased at a rate of about 0.7 degrees Celsius per decade above 4,000 meters compared to 0.3, 0.4 degrees Celsius per decade below 2,500 meters. So higher altitudes have actually warmed more than lower elevation uh, counterparts. Another study uh, has been published here, a number of studies have been pub published here and summarized in a way in this uh, SROC, already mentioned the special report on the ocean, the cryosphere and the changing climate. The, there is a chapter in this, uh, in this report, uh, which is uh, dedicated to high mountain areas, chapter two. And uh, there is a figure uh, which has been compiled by myself and uh, several colleagues showing a synthesis of trends in mean annual temperature in mountain regions based on uh, um, in situ station observations and studies. Uh, more than 8,000 observation stations analyzed. Each line here, each horizontal line here refers to a warming rate from one specific study averaged over the time period, which is reported here in the x-axis, and the colors indicate a different mountain regions in the world and the thickness of the line, the number of observations used in that specific study. If you average the warming rate observed in all these studies, you find that uh, the average warming rate in the mountains in the last decades, in the recent decades, has been uh, about 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade to be compared with the globally averaged warming rate of 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. This is the reason why we, we say that the mountains have warm, warmed more and more rapidly than uh, the global average. Um, what does uh, a model simulation tell us about elevation dependent warming? It is important to say uh, since the beginning that uh, observational studies are in general in smaller agreement with each other than model simulations with each other. And this, this is uh, the reason for that is that um, models, uh, most models at least integrate temperature trend over a very, very long time period, typically up to the end of the 21st century. And uh, generally, when we look uh, at the future with the models, we use uh, uh, um, CO2 concentration scenarios, which uh, are uh, um, higher, which, uh, which uh, uh, make an hypothesis of very high um, emissions because the signal in this case is stronger. So these models uh, um, uh, show a situation in which uh, both warming and elevation dependent warming become more widespread and more intense than they have been so far. But models, as uh, Claudio Cassardo uh, mentioned in his, uh, in his lecture, are also extremely important to understand the mechanisms at play, to be used as our, uh, how to say, laboratory, uh, where we can do experiments, which cannot be do in the real world, of course. We do not have other, uh, other Earth planet into this position, but the models are like a second, the third planet, which we have to perform experiments. 
And uh, in terms of the understanding of elevation dependent warming models uh, um, help us to uh, better disentangle the possible mechanisms at play. Uh, possible DW drivers, for example, are the snow, ice, albedo feedback. Uh, the influence and the changes in cloud cover and in water vapor in the atmosphere both modulate, for example, the downwelling long wave radiation. The presence of aerosols in the atmosphere, especially absorbing aerosol, and a mix of all mechanisms, me mechanisms above. Uh, just a, a small, a small uh, mind on what we mean when we talk about climate feedbacks. Climate feedbacks uh, are important mechanisms uh, uh, that uh, explain much of the internal climate variability. So this kind of variability, which uh, is not forced by uh, natural or anthropogenic factors or forcings. Um, a feedback mechanism, mechanism um, occurs when the input is modified by the output of a process which uh, feedback into the input. A positive feedback amplifies changes in the, in the direction they start. So, a positive feedback amplifies a change and, in a way, destabilizes a system. While negative feedbacks act to resist changes, and for this, a negative feedback tend to push the system back to its original state. So, uh, negative feedback stabilizing, in a way, the system. The ice albedo feedback is very important in the cold regions, in the Arctic uh, and in mountain regions and works uh, more or less like, like that. If we have warming for a given reason, let's say for uh, the increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as observed in the, in the last decades, we have more snow, which is melting, snow and ice, which are melting. So uh, the darker surface beneath the snow and ice absorbs more solar radiation and warms more the surface which causes more melting of snow and ice, which uh, uh, amplify the initial warming. And uh, this cycle continues uh, indefinitely, in a way. Of course, the, this cycle um, works even in the, in the opposite direction. If we have a cooling, then cooling increases snow and ice surfaces. They reflect more solar radiation. They increase the initial cooling, which increases reflection, which which cause more cooling and so on and so forth. So this is one of the most important mechanisms which uh, act in, in the mountains and which is responsible now for the amplification of warming rates with the elevation. Why? Because there's no albedo feedback, which is similar to the vegetation feedback, is relevant in the mountain regions where the seasonal timing of snow cover varies with the elevation and uh, it's important to remember and to stress that the maximum warming rates uh, usually occurs near the annual zero degree isotherm. So a line which uh, is important from the shift water phases. Increase in surface absorption of, absorption of incoming solar radiation around this uh, retreating snow line, this zero degree isotherm, which moves upward. Um, generates announcement of warming rates at this elevation. Since the current snow line is expected to migrate upslope as a consequence of global warming, then warming is expected to extend to increasingly higher elevation. And a similar process is expected to result from the upslope migration of the three lines because uh, the vegetation, um, owing to its color in a way, which is darker than, uh, than, than the soil, uh, the bare soil or water or, or, or snow, of course, uh, is able to absorb more solar radiation. There's no albedo feedback as a stronger influence on the maximum temperature than on the minimum temperature because of the increase in absorbed solar radiation. So it's more a daytime in a way phenomenon rather than a nighttime phenomenon. But there is also a dependence on the soil moisture. If the increased surface shortwave absorption is balanced by 
is in sensible heat fluxes, then we have a, a, a higher response in the maximum temperature. If the increase in the surface shortwave absorption is balanced by uh, latent, by an increase in latent heat fluxes, then we have a most prominent, more prominent response in the minimum temperature, so in nighttime temperatures. So uh, let's have a look at the main consequences which are now observed uh, related to this amplification of warming rates with the elevation. Of course, we have consequences of the state of glaciers, snow, permafrost, uh, and formation of glacial lakes. We have consequences on the precipitation phase. We have more rain than snow, for example, even at the highest altitudes. We have uh, um, an increase in the occurrence in the intensity and frequency of extreme events, which are even uh, extremized in a way in, in the mountains. And we have changes which are really observed in uh, biodiversity and in the ecosystem functioning, especially in the occurrence of ecosystem mismatches. Uh, Claudio already showed this, uh, this figure or a similar one, uh, Pre de Bar Glacier in the Mont Blanc Massif, in three different uh, pictures taken in the same uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and um, owing to uh, Noah's albedo feedback described before, it is interesting to, to say that uh, uh, melting snow and ice are for sure a consequence of warming, but they become at the same time a cause of warming because of the nonlinear feedback loop described before. Another example, uh, the Ron Glacier in Switzerland in a painting by Kaspar Wolf in mid uh, uh, 18th, 18th century. And on the right part of the slide, two pictures in 1850 and 2006, two very different images which speak by, by themselves. Uh, Fradusta, Pale di San Martino uh, in the Eastern uh, Italian Alps. Again, two very different scenes, 1926 against 2016. And this is a picture from the Marmolada Glacier taken from a colleague of mine, uh, Renato Colucci. Uh, from CNR, uh, and this is important uh, really to understand, to better understand the possible role of the ice albedo feedback. Let's see how uh, big is the fraction of uh, uh, the surface which is not still covered by ice and which is able then to absorb more solar radiation uh, rather than to reflect it and to make the warming still uh, higher. Uh, in 2019, we have had in Europe and also in Italy different, uh, uh, very well, I would say, different uh, celebrations for vanishing glaciers, starting from uh, the Oxjokul Glacier in Iceland, a 700-year-old glacier, which has been declared uh, basically dead, up to um, several glaciers in Italy, like uh, the Stelvio Glacier and the Marmolada Glacier, which is uh, shown in this picture. The Marmolada Glacier is one of the Italian glaciers which is expected to, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, thought to be, to have already joined um, its uh, tipping points. So it is expected to, in a way, melt in about 30, 35 years even uh, um, even keeping constant the actual climate, even without any uh, additional warming, because this glacier is completely unbalanced with respect to the um, climate around. Um, other consequences um, are, for example, uh, the um, earlier snow melting, which has uh, important uh, impacts also for everyone, because we use um, we use uh, water coming from snow melt, uh, usually around uh, summer time. But if this snow start melting earlier, there is a risk that is already finished when we really need it in in the in the hot and, and, and dry summer. And still another another effect which is found in the mountains is uh, permafrost stowing. Permafrost is any uh, ground that remains frozen 
So with temperature below 0 degrees, degrees Celsius for at least uh, 2 years straight. And uh, these regions are uh, especially found in uh, the very high latitudes and also in the uh, high altitude mountains. And permafrost near the surface contains large amounts of uh, organic carbon, uh, which uh, comes from material left over from uh, dead plants, for example, that couldn't decompose or uh, uh, rot away uh, due to the cold. And uh, as permafrost uh, tow, the decomposition process uh, uh, releases huge amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, like methane or carbon dioxide, but especially methane, which has a, a, a very high global warming potential, 28 uh, times higher than CO2. So this uh, uh, generates another positive feedback, so an amplification feedback, because more warming mm, lead to, leads to permafrost towing. Permafrost towing leads to a release of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which amplify, further amplify the initial warming. Moreover, uh, when permafrost is, is frozen, is uh, harder than concrete. Where permafrost decomposes, uh, it, ca it, it can generate uh, um, important uh, infrastructural problem and geohydrological hazards and risks. Uh, still another, still another uh, consequence of global warming and its amplification in mountain regions, uh, so-called the glob. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt because this is one of my most yeah. interesting uh, parts. Can, of I, the... can I just uh, say Absolutely. this? This slide and then I stop myself. Uh, GLOF events, uh, glacial lake outburst floods. This happens when uh, lakes uh, swell up from uh, melting glaciers and burst their banks, uh, having the potential to um, immense damage to the uh, communities, of course, below. So this is another important uh, uh, consequence of uh, this amplification of water regions. So I stop here and continue with these other consequences in five, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, no problem. And uh, there are two questions from, from the chat. Mm -hmm. One is uh, from Sijuti. Recently, high emergence areas are experiencing increasing number of cloud bursts, leading to a loss of life and animals. In fact, one hydropower dam under, under construction in Nanda Devi Valley has been devastated. Yeah, I will talk about that probably in the first the slide after the break. Uh, extreme events are becoming um, more frequent and uh, intense, and especially in the mountains, like flash floods, for example. So this kind of uh, extreme precipitation or wind events are, of course, can be destructive and, and, and can lead to catastrophic events, like in this case, for example. Okay, next next question. Uh, is there any standardized procedure for calculating uncertainty in climate models that can be used further, for example, further projection of snow and glacier melt runoff until uh, 20th century? Yes, uh, we will talk about uncertainties uh, toward the end uh, of my presentation, but uh, of course there are uh, standardized exactly standardized way to uh, handle the uncertainties in, in global or regional climate models. And the best practice uh, in a way is not to use just one model, but to use uh, model ensembles because uh, only using different possible realizations of the future climate, we can uh, have an idea of the probability of occurrence of a given climate scenarios, the most probable, the least probable, and uh, uh, the idea is to uh, feed other models, for example, those uh, trying to understand the future behavior of uh, rivers uh, uh, or uh, for, um, uh, I don't know, uh, projecting uh, or better understanding uh, future hazards. Um, these uh, um, uh, small scale models need to be fed with the, the output from uh, uh, larger scale model with their uncertainty. So even the small scale models need to be fed by uh, a, a certain range of possibilities, not just one. 
uh, of course, this means a propagation probably of the uncertainty in the modeling chain, but it is the only way to provide uh, as it should be done always an uncertainty to the climate uh, results. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, Uttarakhand, a hill state in northwest of India, is also facing many climate change issues. Winter rains are decreasing, snowfall is also very less. Uh, we mm -hmm. have lost thousands of hectares of vegetation due to wildfires in the winter 2016 and again yeah. last year. And monsoon yeah. season are not as it used to be. It's changing, yes, that, that's true. Uh, it is measurable now. Uh, in the monsoon dynamics, uh, which affect, of course, uh, the agriculture, for example, in the sub Indian subcontinent. Uh, you, you are anticipating my, my first slide uh, after the break, uh, these extreme events, especially those uh, which uh, are related to the hydrological cycle, to water. Water is one of the protagonists of climate change, uh, both when we have much water and when we have uh, um, small water amounts. Both are uh, dangerous in a way. Okay, the last question. Uh, there is a, an increasing in gloves in recent years. Uh, the big example is Atabat Lake in Unza, Pakistan. It became the big dam now true. and it also affected the human population as well as the terrain. I agree. Uh, satellite observations are to uh, identify in the uh, Himalayan region more than 5,000 glacier lakes which have been formed in, in that way and which uh, uh, need to be monitored in order to prevent possible risks. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Elisa. If, 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 is it okay for you? We can stop for five minutes and then we, we can continue after the break. Okay. Okay, yeah. see you in five minutes, thanks. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, uh, welcome again after this short break, and then uh, giving the floor to Elisa for the the last slot of this lecture. Please, Elisa. Thank you again. Uh, okay, uh, as a, a last uh, effect on of uh, uh, amplified warming in, in mountain regions, would just like to talk a little bit about uh, water-related climatic extremes. Uh, water is a problem, both when we have too little of it and when we have too much of it altogether. Uh, too little of it. Uh, in the mountains, this can be a problem, uh, for example, because of forest fires. At least in Italy, for example, forests are mostly located in mountain regions. So while we have a very long time period without any rain, uh, this can be facilitate a lot the propagation of fires, of course, uh, with important feedbacks also associated to that, uh, just letting to the CO2, for example, emissions coming from forest fires, of course, which still amplify the initial warming. So the third feedback mechanism that we uh, have encountered today. Water is a problem also when there is too much of it, like, for example, in uh, flash floods, uh, usually occurring in, in uh, mountain areas, uh, because there is some rain uh, higher in the mountains and rivers, for example, can become very dangerous uh, and potentially uh, give rise to catastrophic events if the uh, vulnerability of the ter territory is higher and if we are exposed to the risk. So just remember that the risk equation includes uh, three important terms. On the one side, the hazard, so the occurrence of an extreme event, like a, a flood, a flash flood, like an intense precipitation, the vulnerability and the exposure. Uh, as humans, we have uh, affected in a way the frequency and for sure the intensity of certain type of extreme events, uh, like, for example, the heavy rains, by increasing the quantity of water vapor in the atmosphere coming from the uh, evaporation from the oceans, 
and uh, uh, letting the atmosphere to be more energetic. Uh, so there is a, this is a, a, a thermodynamical, in a way, explanation of this uh, um, increased intensity of the extreme events. And we have also amplified uh, sometimes the vulnerability of the territory. For example, when we remove trees uh, that represents for, for, represent for us a protection uh, from these uh, natural hazards. Let's go back uh, one step to the elevation dependent warming phenomenon. Uh, we have seen some of its consequences in a way um occurring in the mountain regions i would like just to show you one example a couple of examples of um, how or the extent to which uh, global models are able to reproduce this phenomenon it is strange because uh, we would be uh, tempt to think that uh, uh, it would be better to use um, finer uh, resolution climate models like for example the regional climate models however in some regions like for example in in this region here the signal is uh, so intense uh, and observable that uh, even the uh, coarser resolution models are able to see a dependence of warming rates on the elevation and particularly an enhancement of warming rates with the elevation this is an example, one study which we published some years ago. Let's see, I don't remember the year, um, 2017. Um, sorry. Uh, using uh, the whole ensemble of global climate models belonging to the CMIP-5 uh, intercomparison experiment, climate model intercomparison project phase five, CMIP-5. Um, now, the uh, models belonging to the CMIP-6 experiment uh, have been uh, uh, almost all released, and this is the basis for the upcoming IPCC assessment report, the sixth. So, these are the different CMIP-5 models, a subset, actually, of the CMIP-5 models, uh, um, which are different for different reasons, uh, but first of all, for the resolution. So they have very different number of pixels in the area of study, which is represented here. We have analyzed elevation dependent warming, future elevation dependent warming in this area. Uh, what is the methodology to assess EDW? We need, first of all, to calculate a warming. Elevation dependent warming means that we need to see whether there is a warming and then if this warming is dependent on the elevation. In order to assess a warming, we need to calculate temperature trends, for example, in degrees Celsius per year or degrees Celsius per decade or per century or so. Or alternatively uh, to the trend, we calculate temperature changes. It is common to do so when we have very long time series into this position, like in this case. Temperature changes um, consists of the difference between two long-term climatologies. For example, we can take, as in this example, 30 years at the end of the 21st century, so the average of the temperature in the period 2071-2100, minus the uh, climatology at the end of the 20th century, 1971-2000, in a given uh, uh, emission scenario, because we are looking at the future, so the model provide uh, climate projections if they are in a way informed about possible uh, so societal, economical, technological, uh, energetic scenarios. In this case, we use the so-called RCP 8.5 scenario, which is one of the uh, one uh, with uh, the highest uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases emissions, the so-called business as usual scenario, BAU scenario. Once we have calculated the temperature change, we need to calculate its relationship with the elevation, which is shown in the figure uh, number two below. Um, usually this relationship is quantified assuming, but it's not uh, really true, a linear relation between warming rates and the elevation. So we uh, find the best fit uh, fitting 
our points and we calculated the slope of this uh, line. And this slope is uh, the uh, quantification of the elevation dependent warming, the derivative of the delta temperature um, over delta zeta, z, the, 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 the altitude. Uh, first row of this uh, figure here shows the elevation dependent warming for the whole ensemble of the CMIP5 models. The, these are the gray area, the huge gray area. In the historical period, this means that in this case, the temperature changes this has been calculated as the difference between the uh, end of the 20th century and the end of the 19th century. Uh, blue and red lines uh, uh, show the um, elevation dependent warming for the minimum temperature, nighttime temperature, and the maximum temperature. There is a slight positive elevation de de dependent warming in the past in this area, the uh, Tibetan Plateau Himalayas, and below in the scenario simulation. So, as I say, said before, the difference between the end of the 21st century and the end of the 20th century. In this case, in the future, EDW is expected to be more intense than in the past. You can see this um, looking at the slope of the red and blue lines. And in particular, for the future simulations, we see that elevation dependent warming quantified through the slope of this linear regression is higher in the cold season for the minimum temperature and in the warm seasons, uh, June, July, August, and September, October, November for the maximum temperatures. Models can be used, as I was saying before, to analyze the possible, uh, possible EDW drivers. So the models are important in, in this sense because they are probably the only tools which we have into this position to have all the variables which uh, potentially uh, are EDW, EDW drivers. It is not possible, it is very difficult to do so with the mm, measurements because it is difficult to have in one specific location at one specific site, not only the temperature observations, but also the observation of many other ancillary variables which are linked to the temperature and which can be responsible for its elevation dependent warming. So the models have uh, by construction all these variables and uh, basically um, all the factors that increase the net, uh, the, the net flux of energy to the surface could or would lead to warming. These variables are the change, for example, in albedo. We have seen that change in albedo is an important driver of this kind of uh, uh, changes uh, through, for example, the snow albedo feedback. Changes in specific humidity because of the water vapor content in the atmosphere. Changes in the downward long wave radiation and short wave radiation. So we analyzed with all the models shown uh, before all these variables, we tried to um, see the extent to which they could actually be EDW drivers. I do not go into the details of, of this. And we found that in fact, all these possible drivers, except the short wave radiation, uh, are uh, in this re region here, EDW drivers, but the most important one is the change in albedo. So probably in this region here, the snow albedo feedback plays a very important role in explaining the changes which are projected by these models of the minimum and of the maximum temperatures. Given the presence of a change in albedo, the change in specific humidity and in the downward long wave radiation help us to better predict or explain uh, the, our predictant, that is uh, the temperature change. Um, another study uh, not only analyzed the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayas, but uh, a couple of other regions, uh, mountain regions located in the mid latitudes, and in particular the Rocky Mountains and the Greater Alpine region, not just using different models, an ensemble of different models like the CMIP5 models, but just one model, which was run in, in my previous institute. It is called the East Earth trying to 
uh, run this model at different spatial resolution from 16 kilometers, which is a resolution currently used, uh, for example, in, uh, in, in the geological uh, forecasts, uh, up to 125 kilometers, which is, uh, diciamo, uh, which is the average uh, resolution of the state of the art current global climate models. This study was really intended to analyze the impact on the model resolution in the representation of this phenomenon of elevation dependent warming. We expect, we can expect that the higher the resolution, the better is the representation of a phenomenon which is strongly dependent on the topography, of course. We found that uh, overall the model resolution plays a crucial, crucial role only in uh, small mountain areas. In this case, the smallest among those analyzed was the Alpine region here in the middle. And only in small areas such as the Alps, the model resolution plays a role and having a um, finer resolution could uh, improve our results because a two course resolution in such a small area will lead to an under representation of the highest altitudes, of course. Uh, so in the small areas, increasing the spatial resolution is uh, uh, fundamental. However, uh, improve an improvement in the spatial resolution of the model is not the panacea to all uh, uh, issues which we encounter in, uh, in the description and uh, understanding of this phenomena. Also working on uh, model parameterization is important, particularly the parameterizations involving surface and subsurface processes, the snow albedo feedback and the cloud radiation feedbacks. Again, in this study, we found some interesting results. First of all, uh, among the three ones analyzed, the region which is found to be more prone to forming is the Tibetan Plateau Himalayas and the season showing the most striking evidence of EDW in all region is autumn. And this is not by chance, we think, because uh, autumn is uh, one of the two transition regions, seasons in the mid latitudes between uh, transition between what? Between snow free areas and snow covered areas. So climate warming, the increase of temperatures is delaying the onset of snow cover at low and mid altitude. And this trend is expected to continue in the future decades involving higher and higher elevations. Therefore, larger snow free areas are expected in autumn and uh, uh, this is also the reason why the snow albedo feedback and the changes in albedo is, expect, is expected to be in this study, in this area, and in this season, the most important driver of elevation dependent warming. Another complicated picture taken from the chapter number two of the special report on the ocean, the cryosphere and changing climate published by the IPCC in 2019. I don't go into the details of, of this picture, just uh, this is a summary picture or what we know about elevation dependent changes in uh, snow depth or snow water equivalent uh, in the left part of each, uh, of each uh, uh, ensemble of figures in uh, winter air temperature and in summer air temperature. Just look, for example, at the uh, Himalaya, the uh, panel labeled with the E letter and look at the winter air temperature change middle panel. You see, you clearly see here, maybe I can use uh, a pen. No, I can't, or maybe yes. Mm -hmm. You see that the temperature is expected to increase a little bit and then to stabilize the temperature change. So there is elevation dependent warming here. For example, in summer air temperature, we have some stable behavior here and then an increase. So. The different studies go, especially when using the models, for an amplification of warming rates with the elevation. But of course, uh, this is not a coherent picture found everywhere, in every region, in every season, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of research is being uh, uh, performed 
uh, in order to better understand uh, this phenomenon. Uh, as an extension of elevation dependent warming, I would like to talk about uh, uh, elevation dependent uh, climate change to be uh, quite general, but more specifically, elevation dependent change in precipitation extremes. This is a paper in preparation together with colleagues from the University of Turin. Um, and we tried to understand whether not only warming is different in different uh, altitude bands in a given mountain region, but also if uh, uh, the observed or projected, as in this case, trend in other variables, uh, and especially in variables uh, um, uh, which uh, quantify the climate extremes, uh, their trend can vary uh, with the elevation. So we focused on uh, um, precipitation extremes, for example, in the, in the uh, right part of this plot, uh, days with precipitation greater than one millimeter, days with precipitation greater than 20 millimeters, days with precipitation greater than the 95th percentile of precipitation calculated with respect to a past climatology are all uh, um, uh, precipitation extreme indices defined uh, uh, internationally and uh, in, uh, in a standard way by a working group called ATCCDI. And what we found actually if, uh, is that if we calculated these trends, the, the temporal trends of these variables, of these precipitation extremes, and we calculated these trends specifically for different elevation bin, uh, you can see the different colors here uh, exactly reproduce different altitude bins. You can see, look for example at this, uh, at this part here of, the, of the figure, that in fact there is a differentiation um, of this trend uh, from one altitude bin to another. And in most cases, in most regions, the regions are here in the x-axis, the Tibetan Plateau, the Leus Plateau, the Alps uh, and other, uh, these are the, uh, all mountain regions in the world, we have an amplification so not only of warming rates with the elevation, but also of the uh, extreme precipitation trends. So mountains are in a way able for some extremes and not for all of them to uh, amplify uh, the signal of change in these extreme events. So mountains uh, extremize, as I was saying at the beginning, some extreme events. Okay. Uh, Last part, um, a few words about the future of our mountains and then a small chapter, final chapter about the quantification of the uncertainties in the models. Uh, there was a question also on that, so I think it is important to stress it again. The future of mountains. I, I, I'd like to describe the future of mountains through a couple of examples taken from the literature. First one, uh, a study published in 2020, last year, from, uh, again, colleagues uh, from uh, Italian University as, and, and, and CNR, um, analyzing, in this case, the equilibrium line altitude of the glaciers and the shifting toward the higher elevations of this equilibrium line altitude, ELA. ELA is the average elevation of uh, uh, the zone where accumulation equals uh, ablation over one year period. So basically, uh, we are observing a, a, a upslope movement of this equilibrium line altitude. And basically, the position of this uh, line, which is not a real line, of course, uh, indicates also the altitudes at which uh, glacier can survive, of course, in the future. And this study analyzes uh, uh, the um, past and future trend uh, of the equilibrium line altitude over 200 years from the past up to the future. So about 100 years in the past, 100 in the future and found that this equilibrium line altitude, depending on the emission scenario, which we consider, here we consider two, three emission scenarios, RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. 2.6 is a strong mitigation 
scenario, we are able to strongly reduce our emissions and, and achieve the, um, uh, the balance, uh, the zero uh, net emissions in 2050. RCP 4.5 is a stabilization scenario. RCP 8.5 is a, a business as usual scenario. Well, in these three scenarios, the equilibrium line altitude is, ex is expected to shift, shift upward of about 100 meters, um, of about uh, uh, 400 meters and of about 700 meters, uh, respectively. This means that in the uh, most uh, sustainable, I will say, mitigation scenario, the number percentage of glacier that will remain will be of about 30%. So the about 60% of glacier is expected to disappear even in the mitigation, mitigation scenario. In the most extreme and negative and pessimistic um, emission scenario, the 90 percent of glaciers in the Alps is expected to disappear at the end of this century. And this is in line with other studies in the Alps, for example, in Switzerland, says, saying more or less the same thing and, and projecting the same fate for uh, glacier at the end of the century under a high emission uh, greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gas emission scenario. This figure was uh, very quickly shown before by Claudio. I can spend uh, some words more on that. Tipping points. I've already mentioned the possibility that uh, an Italian glacier like the Marmolada has already reached uh, its tipping point uh, because um, continued emissions of GHGs, continuous uh, land use changes, cause, of course, further warming. Uh, but not only in the means, in the average climate, not only in the climate extremes, but uh, uh, these changes uh, um, will also increase in the likelihood of irreversible impacts for ecosystems and for people. Irreversible impacts are so-called tipping points. So there is a study, Schellenbauer here, in, published in 2016, which has analyzed possible ecosystems uh, reaching their tipping points, uh, given a, a uh, uh, given uh, temperature increase at the end of the century. For example, even with the plus two degrees Celsius in 2100, with respect to the pre-industrial values, we have, for example, the Alpine glacier here which have a medium risk to um, reach their tipping point. For small glaciers, for example, this risk can be already there, for example, for the Marmolada glacier. So there are a relatively high number of ecosystems which uh, encounter already the risk to, um, to approach their tipping points, even with uh, one degree more respect to today temperature increase. Other uh, ecosystems will probably or are expected to reach their tipping points with higher temperature increases at the end of the century, four, five, six, eight or more. So this is this should be uh, taken into account, of course. So the climate can change not only in the means and in the extremes, but also in the possibility to uh, reach uh, and to undergo these uh, irreversible changes. And uh, um, this has been also um, strongly mentioned and discussed in this other special report on, uh, on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius at the end of the century, which was published one year before the SROC IPCC assessment report 2018. So just to conclude, I will spend the uh, 10 minutes more or less to better explain the uncertainty in model simulation, and then I will go to the conclusions. Um, what are the main sources of uncertainties in global and in regional model simulations? They are basically three. Three sources of uncertainty. One is related to the internal climate variability. What is this? Internal climate variability is the variability which is not forced 
by natural of anthropogenic forcing. So there is that kind of variability which is inherent in the climate system, that one which uh, makes the temperature time series goes going up and down, as Claudio Cassardo explained before, generated internally in the climate system, which is not related to any forcing which is applied externally. It can be either natural or anthropogenic. Uh, beyond a few years, this is unpredictable. And this uh, so-called also initial condition uncertainty can be sampled very well in models using multi-member ensemble. That is, uh, ensemble of models where the model is always the same, but uh, uh, initial conditions are um, changed a little bit before the simulation starts. The second kind of uncertainty is the modeling uncertainty, also called stru structural or parametric uncertainty. This strongly depends on the way we are able to reproduce in a computer the climate system working, its components and the interactions between the components. The structural uncertainty comes from the different ways we use to approximate the climate system when building a model, which is just a uh, simplification, of course, of the real climate. Parametric uncertainty comes from um, the different uh, way we can choose parameters that control, for example, the unresolved processes, so the parametrizations, or when we use empirical formulas, when we do not have an equation into disposition based on the physical law, uh, on the physical, thermodynamical, biological law that govern a given process. When we do not know the equations, we have to use empirical formulas, which of course need some parameters to be included. So these parameters can be different from one, for example, research group to another using different techniques, etc. So these um, lead to uh, some uncertainty in model simulation. This uncertainty can be sampled using multi-model ensemble, like, for example, the CIMIP-5 models. You remember the huge gray area in the example shown for the elevation-dependent warming in the Himalayas? This is uh, uh, the spread of the different models, and these are uh, different models uh, uh, implemented in different research centers, and this constituted a multi-model ensemble, which is able to um, quantify this modeling uncertainty. And finally, the scenario uncertainty, the most difficult to probably to understand, uh, because um, and the most uncertain, because uh, uh, this is the uncertainty related to the way we will go ahead uh, in the future the global socioeconomic uh, choices which we, we will make, the global socioeconomic development as, and the associated greenhouse gas, aerosol emissions and land use exploitation. And this is really the, 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 the hugest uncertainty because it is related to our behavior in a way. These different um, uncertainties have a different weight <laughs> in the model simulation, especially during the simulation time. And uh, as you can see here, the green uh, one, which is scenario uncertainty, is the one which uh, whose spread is higher as the time frame of the simulation is, uh, uh, is, uh, is um, longest. So toward the end, for example, of this century, the internal variability and the model spread stays more or less constant throughout the simulation period. Okay, I, I go to, toward the conclusion, so I just uh, uh, leave some time maybe for questions. Future needs. Future needs to better study and understand the climate changes in the mountains. To improve our knowledge of the mountain temperature trends of elevation dependent warming, elevation dependent change in climate extreme and the controlling or driving better mechanisms, we need improved observations. And uh, I said at the beginning, especially, I think, I do really think an integration between all different kinds of observations in order to extract and, and use the best from each of them, 
um, and improve model simulations, both uh, large scale models, because they are important, because they constitute the first step in every modeling chain. But of course, also a refinement of the regional climate model, because they allow to uh, provide a regional or even local characterization of the climatic conditions and their future projections. And this is especially important when we want to look at the local impacts of climate change, because climate change occurs everywhere and globally, but the impacts of climate change have a stronger regional and local uh, manifestation, of course. Um, again, especially when talking about observations, uh, um, in situ clim climate observing networks need to be expanded, especially um, covering the poorest regions, those which are mostly undersampled even today. High altitude la areas, for example, above 4,000 meters are heavily, heavily under monitored, the tropics also. Uh, the observation sites should be also improved by including more variables, uh, especially when uh, a given study is intended not only to measure a given variable, but also to understand its behavior, for example. So take elevation dependent warming uh, in order to understand the possible amplification of warming rates with the elevation or just the dependence of warming rates with, with the elevation, we need to know much more than only temperature. We need to know the behavior of humidity, of radiation, of clouds, of aerosols, probably also of precipitation, of soil moisture, of snow cover. It is important to have observation sites, at least uh, a few of them, which uh, measure all these set of variables. Some like anchor stations providing all the variables and then float station just providing a, uh, a, a lower number of variables. Targeted field campaigns should be performed in areas where the climate change signal is expected to be strongest. For example, uh, around the zero degree isotherm for the ADW studies will be very important to monitor the area which is around this, uh, um, this, uh, this region here. Because otherwise we, we take the risk to neglect the regions which are currently undergoing the stronger changes. And this is important to understand the changes because they reflect then on uh, everyone, on the society, on our needs and on the services which we exploit from the mountain ecosystem. Mountains. Uh, finally, should also be regarded as an opportunity for me to develop new research approaches because uh, mountains, uh, um, of course, have intrinsic methodological challenges for us observation, but this apparent or real difficulty should probably be used as uh, an incentive to increase our capacity of observing and understanding what is happening in the mountains. So mountains represent an important opportunity to develop more robust approaches of study and to integrate different kinds of observations, as well as to improve our model simulations. And with this final message, I would like to thank you. And I think I stop here. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. And uh, hey, that was uh, this beautiful picture. <laughs> I really ah, love yes. it. I love glaciers. <laughs> so, okay, um, I'm not objective in my. <laughs> uh, there are two. You are biased. Taken from a oh. uh, colleague of mine, Josto von Ardenberg. Yeah, the Alec Glacier, uh, Switzerland. Yeah, the longest in Europe. Okay, so uh, there are uh, two questions. The first one is from Claudia, uh, who is asking uh, if you can repeat what uh, each scenario represents, RCP 2.6, RCP 4.5, and 8.5. Yes. Um, scenarios, I, I don't have a specific slide on that, I'm sorry, but uh, um, 
the different scenarios are different uh, uh, reproduce different uh, um, concentration pathways uh, greenhouse gas concentration pathways expected for the coming decades up to the end of the century for example the rcp 2.6 scenario is a scenario uh, projecting a um, stabilization of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, around the um, half of this century, around 2050, even before probably, and then a decrease in the concentration of greenhouse gases. And the maximum um, radiative force, the maximum quantity of uh, energy accumulated in the system uh, is 2.6 watt per square meter. This is the reason why the, the number associated with the uh, scenario. RCP 4.5 project an accumulation of extra energy of about 4.5 watt per square meter. And it is a stabilization scenario, meaning that uh, uh, the greenhouse gas concentrations are expected following their emissions, of course, to increase uh, in this century, but to stabilize at the end of the century. 8.5 um, scenario is a scenario with uh, an increasing um, uh, greenhouse gas concentration in these centuries and beyond that. So we do not see any stabilization uh, in 2100 uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and by sense uh, forcing, in this sense, positive radiative forcing, so extra accumulation of energy in the system, 8.5 watt per square meter, in this century does not stabilize absolutely, but will continue um, beyond. More okay. or less, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks for the, the resume. Then there is a, a question from Pranay. There is a big challenge to disseminate scientific data on global warming to the policymakers as well as vulnerable communities. We need to come out with innovative ideas and should promote social innovation to reach the communities with facts and figures. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Not only facts, uh, uh, in a way, scientific facts only or figures, but some uh, mm, language which is able to speak in a way more to our emotions, uh, to our soul, I would say, no, because uh, we need to feel ourselves involved in the problem. Uh, and I think that uh, probably the language of the literature, of uh, the arts, uh, of the music, in a way, are able to convey more effectively this message. So the people, including the policymakers, uh, are not only, uh, how to say, something to fill continuously with data, figures, uh, um, uh, uh, showing uh, how dangerous the situation, the, the situation is and is expected probably to be, but try to find really another way of communicate these uh, messages in order to make people uh, more involved in first person in the problem. My opinion, eh? of course, my personal opinion. And yeah. in terms oh, of policy makers, if I can add one thing, I I'm just uh, thinking yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, in real time. I think that to better communicate with policy makers, uh, the scientific community, which is doing, I think, a great work, a great job in communicating with um, the uh, citizens, but with something which is missing, in my opinion, a bidirectional communication. The scientific community produces the reports, which uh, and and, and uh, asks, in a way, policymakers to read these reports, even the summaries for policymakers, which are shortened, but it's not possible, it is difficult, I think, for a policymaker to read even a shortened ex ex um, uh, version of the, the very huge and big uh, IPCC reports. It is important, uh, on the contrary, to establish a 
which is uh, structural in a way where the scientists answer to specific uh, user needs, to specific requests, not just providing reports and then leaving the other to go through the pages, but trying to engage a continuous uh, exchange of ideas. This is for me something which should be, at least here in Italy, strongly improved. Okay, I, I, I completely agree. <laughs> Maybe we, we, we need to, to organize another live aid concert to. Okay, um, thank you for yes. uh, your such insightful presentation. The elevation dependent warming in mountain section is really interesting and also require a lot of research. True, in fact, it's a quite young uh, discipline, I would say. But there is um, a lot of activity ongoing um, now, yeah, in the world research uh, community all over the world. Okay, uh, there is a very long <laughs> question concerning uh, monitoring of climatic data for mountain regions in developing and underdeveloped country will be of key importance. Through these are very sensitive to climate change. We don't have adequate historical local climate data. With our previous experience on using climate modeling for understanding species habitat suitability, we found that more appropriate future climate projection can be done if we can integrate the anthropogenic impact too. What is your opinion on this? I agree, absolutely. The very um not the last generation of models because this is something uh, like a projection of new models uh, called the digital twins now we have the global climate models also called earth system models but the future will be with uh, the digital twins uh, uh, some copies of the earth in a way including much more the anthroposphere as something which is uh, with the humans able to um, impact on the climate system and modify the climate system. So every anthropogenic impact uh, is expected, let's see if we will, we will be, be able to do, to do that, to be included in the model much more than today. Um, so absolutely, I agree with the necessity to integrate also this component, this sphere, the anthroposphere in the model, not just the natural spheres like the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, the biosphere, etc., the pedosphere, but also the anthroposphere. Okay, uh, the last two questions, uh, also uh, from the same uh, the same participant. Also, would like to have your opinion on climate and anthropogenic impacts on long-term ecosystem service scenarios. Different, uh, difficult question. Not sure to understand it. The anthropogenic impacts on uh, the ecosystem service scenarios. So, given the influence uh, of the anthropogenic actions on the climate, and not only, also other changes which are driven by our actions on, uh, for example, let's think of, uh, to pollution. Uh, of different elements, uh, or water pollution, air pollution, um, generation of waste, all these actions uh, together with climate change, together with the big problem of biodiversity loss, of course, uh, interact to uh, threaten, in a way, the capacity of the ecosystem to uh, deliver their functions and their services to everyone. So in this sense, uh, my opinion is that uh, anthropogenic impact is huge and uh, is, uh, is uh, important for both uh, the climate changes we are observing and other environmental changes which are found, especially in the mountains. Okay, thank you so much. And we are moving to the last question of this uh, of this session. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, how has the two 
fundamental EPCC special reports uh, being operationalized uh, for decision making process purpose. One million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> through uh, a, a, a huge, uh, for me, as, as I was saying before, exactly what I, I already said, through a day-by-day -day work and communication between the scientific community and the policymakers community. These reports are fundamental uh, in order to take uh, scientific-based policy decisions, but uh, need to be understood in order to be done to be applied and to be implemented this law or decision so in order to really understand the content of these fundamental uh, reports uh, there is a need um, of continuous dialogue between uh, the different components of our society the science and the civil community including citizens and the um, policy makers and stakeholders. Dialogue. For me, the answer uh, is, uh, is, is, is this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elisa, for this, uh, this very interesting, interesting lecture. And also, thank you. Thank you, Claudio. I would invite everybody to open their, their camera and their microphone to say thank you to our lecturers and uh, to conclude this, uh, this very interesting uh, session. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Elisa and Claudio, and uh, see you, thank you tomorrow. Thank you, thank you very much, it was wonderful lecture. Thank you also for, for your questions. Thank you thank also you for your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you so very much. good questions. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye, Claudio. Bye. Salute, Claudio and Elisa. Great job. Grazie. Bye.